Davey, how are you, brother? I'm fine, thanks, Will. Much appreciated. Yeah, it's been it's been quite a while, isn't it, since we saw each other last? But it was on my run, wasn't it? On my yeah, I was just about to say. I think the last time I saw you was in um, Russell Humphrey's home in Shrewsbury. Yes, we, yes, uh, sir. We picked you up and dropped you. You insisted we dropped you back at the same spot so that you made sure you did it and didn't uh, cheat in any way. Yeah. Yes. Big shout out to to, to Russ. He really, really looked after me. He he got on his motorbike the next day and he um, made sure I was all right for the next thirty miles. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he didn't put you on the back though. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, w- I wish he had it done. <laughs> so, Davy. Um, Friends at home, uh, Davey's an old friend of mine, um, the youngest Royal Marine to serve in the Falklands, which I think just in itself is a, a fascinating, fascinating thing to chat about. And uh, I remember you telling me, Davey, uh, when we stayed in London that time about traveling down there and uh, you were telling me about an old sweat that was giving you some shit for doing your dobie or, <laughs> or something. I've got a really good story from, from that. Uh, we'll go through that, but I've got a fantastic story. His name was Taft Cooper, uh, and we remember on SS Canberra. And, um, yeah, I, honestly, uh, I'll tell you the story about that, but I'll also tell you what happened last week. I actually met him. I, we spotted <laughs> each other. And, um, yeah, I'll tell you it's a funny story, that is, yeah. Yeah, please do. So what year did you join up, Davey? I joined up to uh, 27th of April, 1981. Yeah, in uh, yeah, yeah, joined CTC. Wow, that was back when training was really easy, wasn't it? Oh, I tell you what, after after watching the lads and the excellent machines they are now, it probably was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, were you in training with Terry Terry Marsh? No, Terry Marsh was um, in before me. Terry was because obviously I knew Terry uh, from um, basically what happened was uh, Terry was in the, the Royal Marines. And he was just about to leave the Royal Marines, probably about six months. Uh, once I'd finished my training in the Royal Marines and joined the Royal Navy Boxing Squad, uh, Terry was on it, but he was just about to leave to go into professional. Yeah, got you. I got a funny dit about um, Terry. My, I think it was my mate H was telling me he was in training with Terry. And do you remember the thing where you used to have queue up for the phone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, the tra- phone, yeah but, phones, but the train ranks could just cut to the they would cut to the front yeah and uh so uh, friends at home train ranks as someone who's got their green berry um terry marsh was in the queue and this train rank came in put, pushed in the front and uh terry said to him wait you know away with you and the bloke went no i would train rank and apparently terry knocked him out <laughs> <laughs> well i'll have to ask him that when i see him Yes, friends at home again. If you if if you're too young to remember Terry Marsh, he was a, a, a boxing champion. He was was he world champion? He was certainly yeah. yeah he, he was like Royal Marines champion, Royal Navy champion, combined services champion, box for his box for England, international, and then ended up obviously turning professional and become um, I think it was world lightweight like welterweight champion of the world. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Yes, Terry, if you're watching, please come on the podcast. Be Great to speak to you, Royal. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So, um, did was training any problem for you? I mean, that's that's young, isn't it? Were uh, you sixteen when you joined? I was sixteen when I joined. I was eight stone three, I think I was when I when I joined. Uh, and uh, there was fifty eight of us, two seven six troop, a junior troop, and um, yeah, there was fifty eight of us, and we ended up with sixteen originals. Um, some a, a lot left, but some of the lads obviously um, left uh, on not on their own accord. They obviously got injured and went got what they used to call hunter troop. Then when I was, I think it's called something else now, but it was used to call hunter troop. And we had... Yeah, sorry, go for it. Yeah, so so basically there was fifty eight of us. Um, uh, we got down to 16 originals after the injuries. I think we passed out about 38 because we got people that sort of joined us just for the pass out because they've obviously been injured. And um, I think we had, we had one lad called David Patterson who joined who passed out with us, joined up with us. He'd he'd hurt, him, he'd hurt his leg, big star, and um, and he had to go on the side on the you know stand on the side, which it's not a very nice feeling, I suppose, when you pass out. 
I'm just a standing watch in your blues. But yeah, a shame for him. David Patterson from, lives in New Zealand now. Mm. Yeah, it's the mental thing as well, isn't it? Coming back from Hunter Troop. I've had a few lads contact me from Hunter Troop and um, it it's getting getting back into it and keeping up the enthusiasm. And I'm, I'm pleased to say I had a few words with them and uh, bang, they've all got their green lids now. So That's brilliant. Well, we, yeah. uh, we had some characters in, in T76 who, um, I want to jump forward a bit first. What we've basically done over the last um, month and a half, we've actually uh, decided, or one of the lads, Brum Tennant, Squid Tennant, decided he wanted to find the lads. So um, it's 40 years and he decided, we, we, we passed out on December uh, the 11th, just gone. And he wanted to try and get us together, but he couldn't find anybody. And then he found me. And due to me and um, um, the Sergeant Blackman episode, where thousands of people are on my site, we were able, we were able to get 22 of us. So there's 22 of us in contact with each other now. And we're going to meet up on, in September. And... Um, Mickey, uh, Mickey, Mickey Rooney, his name, he's the character from Manchester. He now lives in Taunton, I think, uh, scaffolding business. He, um, he, was just, he was just, he was one of the ones where, you know, you're in training and um, you just want to get down the stairs and get lined up ready outside and prep, you know, with your stuff on, um, you know, with all your rig on and the outside and there'd be always one late and it'd be him, you'd look up the window in the windows and uh, he'd be there and he'd just be laughing and you'd be like, Rooney, get your bloody ass down here. And he'd just laugh. And he'd like, mate, we've got seconds. And he, for some reason or other, he always used to get away with it. He used to sit there, stand up, jump in line. And then within one second, they'd come around the corner. I think, how have you done it? And he, he, was, he was just a character. He's a brilliant character. And you've got to have characters, haven't you, when you're in your training? Yes, so, you, yeah, you, 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 you certainly have. And you certainly get, you, you get an interesting mix, don't you, of, yeah, people all yeah. across, all across the, uh, all across the board. Yeah, well, we had we done really well in uh, training. We had a fantastic um, um, chief petty officer. Um, well, no, it was a petty officer. So petty officer PT uh, Derek Pierce, uh, Jan Pierce, uh, and to be fair to him, he is what Royal Marines are today. What he would like to train today, he. In 81, I'm not saying it's any different to now, but in 81, you were not bullied, but you were, they carried the build. Yeah, you know, if you did something wrong, you knew about it. But nowadays it's, right, guys, what's gone wrong there? How can we fix it? And and Jan Pierce was that type. And uh, unfortunately, Jan didn't really get on with the, the, uh, the Royal Marines uh, training team because they were old, style and Jan seemed to be in his head a good 20 years ahead uh, and he had a different way of training people and uh, he became a really good friend uh, Jan did because obviously I boxed from the age of um, well I started training from the age of eight so for eight years I was a really fit person I was a I was a really good at cross country I was cross country champion so I was quite fit when I joined up and I'd had I think I'd had something like under maybe under fights uh, as a boxer before I joined up, um, eighty odd, and um, he loved that. Jan did, and so I was quite fit. And in the end, when we passed out, I was awarded the PT medal, the GPMG medal, and the Commando medal. And we did a story about um, Jan. We we actually went for the um, endurance course record, uh, and basically. As you know, the endurance course, you had to go with the other two lads. So there'd be three of you to help each other to get through the tunnel. But once you get through the tunnel, then we could split. And um, and Jan said, once you've gone through that tunnel, we are going for it. We are going to get this endurance course record. I want you to get it. Um, and we we were 17 seconds out of the endurance course record. And um, a lot of royals on now, and probably civilians won't know this, but at the end of the endurance course record, uh, and at the end of the endurance course, once you went into the main gate, you then had to head, as you know, to the to the uh, to the ranges, and you had to fire ten rounds off. And if you got your ten rounds off, and I think it was a seven at the time or eight, hit the target, you were knocked one minute off. So, 
Jampe is, is chuffed a bit. He's like, Dave, 17 seconds off. We can get down there. We can go and get you this, this endurance course record. So off we went down to the ranges and um, I won't name him, but our troop sergeant said, um, oh, he's flew past. He don't need to do the ranges. And Jam was like, no, 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 no. We wanted, he needs to do it because if we can knock him in off, he's got the endurance course record. And for some reason or other, we don't know why they wouldn't allow me to do it. So I was never given the chance to get the endurance course record for the, for the time in, um, in obviously being in November, December in um, 81. Yes, the endurance course. Uh, for me, that's like everything about the Royal Marines, just just that test. Yeah. Um, Obviously, 30-miler, which is, a, which is a, a killer as well, isn't it? Yeah, the 30-miler. But for me, I, I'd never managed to pass. And I think we had two runs at it, maybe three. And I, I the first one, I was awful. I, I was literally something like 35 minutes over the time. Wow. Um, and on that day... I learned something about myself and that is if you don't give up, <laughs> you can achieve amazing things. Yeah. And, and I come off that course. I looked at my watch. I was the slowest I'd ever done the actual course. Yeah. And I thought if I, if I don't, I'm going to get back trooped if I don't pass this or you get one, one rerun at it. But yeah. So I, I think just, um, the, the 30 miler, um, cause it, uh, people don't really like realize this, but it's eight hours for for recruits and seven hours for the for the officers. Mm. And I think I actually think we got under seven hours. I think we got six hours fifty eight. We just got under because we're halfway down. We, we decided there's a troop. You know, we're we're going to try and beat this and show the officers that we're just as good as them because we're only a junior troop. So yeah, if I, if I remember right, we actually got under seven hours, which is brilliant. It was. So are you? A- a can- colonel now, sir. Oh, not a chance. <laughs> not a chance. Yeah, I uh, yeah, I started putting one foot in front of the other, and then I just didn't stop, and I didn't stop, and I could sense as I was running through that pain that this is what being a marine is about. It, you know, that that is it. That just to just yeah. keep going and keep going. Remember did my. Tr- have, did you have in your head, um, like I did, but most people did, I think, that in their head they're counting one, two, three, four, one. To, and, and just and just looking at the the, the steps in between, and your head was down. And you just didn't sort of stop, did you? And then somebody'd say something, you'd look up, and oh, it's a it's a water break or something. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's exactly it. Just to kind of steady plod, but don't don't stop. In, yeah, it was an incredible incredible experience. I'd like to go back and do it again, to be honest. So, um, yeah. So, uh, Davy, you you went to. Four two first, yeah. But basically, right. This is where it gets a bit confusing for for for, for my head, and my jigsaw puzzle, and um, I'm useless at. I, I, obviously, I know you, um, but your face I'll never forget because I'm brilliant when it comes to face and numbers. But when it comes to names, for some reason or other, I don't know if I took too many left hooks, but, but basically, I cannot remember names. So basically, what happened was I um, we passed out December eleventh, and we were sent on leave as you do for a few days. And then I was given um, four two commando, Bickley Barracks, M Company, nine troop. So I I get down to Bickley Barracks, and first thing happens is we line up. They're dead nervous. Uh, we line up in the troop, um, and company sergeant major and the sergeant comes out, and first thing they do is they shout, uh, "Marine Rob." So obviously you stand to attention, step forward, hand in the air. Yes, sir. Uh, right, I believe you on the GPMG at CTC. Yes, sir. Ah, there you are. And like everybody else, it's yours. So I'll get given it. Uh, and then it's obviously in January this time. Um, I think it might have been late December or it was very early January. And um, we're packing for Norway. We're just about to go off to Norway for, for three months, as 4-2 Commander did at that time. And... Um, Somebody shouted, Rob, you need to go to Marine Rob, get yourself into the uh, company sergeant major's office. He wants a word. So I'm right, right. So I go into the company sergeant major's office. Hello, sir. Uh, right, close the door. Um, you're not coming to Norway. I'm like, what? You're not coming to Norway. You've got to go off um, and fight for the Navy title. We hear you're a brilliant boxer. Uh, so you're off. You're not coming to Norway. I'm like, oh, why? Okay. Um, so being young, 
17, I was like, okay, just do as I'm told. If I'm given an order, I'll go and do it. Um, I just won the, the Royal Marines title, actually in training, still in training. The Royal Marines uh, championships were on. Uh, and they wanted me to win the Royal Marines title or see if I could win it. Um, so that's what I did. I won, I'd won the Royal Marines title in training. So then I was sent off to HMS Nelson in Portsmouth. Four Chief Commander went off to do their, um, their Norway. And whilst we were in Norway, uh, I'd gone, I'd been able to go and get the, the Navy title. And then I travelled with the Royal Navy squad all around the country against Northwest, Northeast, Midlands. You know, it was representing the Royal Navy, obviously the Royal Marines. We then um, came back at the end of March and they said, right, Fort Hugh Grand have just come back from Norway. They're on leave. Go on leave and um, get yourself back to, to um, I think it was around the 8th or 9th or 10th of April. Get yourself back to, um, back to barracks. So... I'm sat there in Stoke and Trent where my mum lived at the time and I'm watching the telly with my mum and all of a sudden it comes across breaking news, Royal Marines and all paratroopers return to, to your barracks. I'm like, how's this? And it comes up on the TV, uh, the Argentinians have um, invaded the Falklands. So I looked at my mum and I said, what the hell are they doing up Scotland? What are they, what are they doing up Scotland? Who the hell wants to go all the way up Scotland? It's freezing. Not, not realising how cold it was in the Falklands. It's freezing up Scotland. Always pissing down in rain. No good. And um, yeah, so I basically uh, listened to the the the, um, the breaking news on the news on the TV, uh, and it said because uh, I was thinking straight away, well, I'm going to get down there. I've gone and get a ticket, and it come up. Um, get yourself down to your nearest uh, train station if you haven't got a vehicle, and um, tell them who you are. Show your ID. And you were given a ticket, and I was given a one-way ticket back to Bickley Barracks, and that's how I heard about the Falcons' war. It's just beyond words, mate, isn't it? You know, the, just a reality. I mean, I, I bet you felt quite proud at that moment. You know that you're you're you're, you're being called to serve your country. Yeah, and the other thing was was that I was quite young. It's probably probably naive and I don't think wow we're going to war we're here you know you know and um, I'm gonna yeah I'm, I'm going to join the Royal Marines and then as I'm getting down there and as I joined uh, Bickley and I joined M Company um, I'm thinking where are we going who are we with and, and then all of a sudden same again we're packing our stuff Marie Rob get to the company's our major's office I'm like so I go to the company's our major's office again close the door again Hi, Dave. I say, right, you're not coming with us. I'm like, you're having a laugh. He goes, uh, you're not coming with us. You're going uh, to headquarters. I'm like, right, why? And he says, um, basically, because you're not art of warfare trained, I can't tell you at the moment we're going somewhere else. M company are about to go and do something, but we've got to keep it quiet at the moment. And then obviously, a couple of days later, I find out that they gone to they, they were going off to South Georgia first, mm. South Georgia, uh, and apparently had to be Arctic Warfare trained. But it's a very strange thing is, that after meeting some of the lads and talking to some lads now, um, some of them have said, no, I wasn't Arctic Warfare trained. So I maybe, um, I find out afterwards, 20, 30 years later, that my mother had decided to ring the company Sergeant Major Tell the Sergeant Major that her 17 year old son wasn't going anywhere near the Falcons, he wasn't going to war, and she'd come down and sort a few of the lads out, and sort a few Roman Marines out. The company Sergeant Major Pound was laughing his head off and said, As far as I'm concerned, your, your lad is fully trained Roman Marines commando, and he is more than capable of looking after himself, and we will look after him, Mrs. Bob. And my mum basically said to him, If you don't, and something happens to him, I assure you I will be down there and I will find you. And I think that's where the saying from <laughs> that film was come, and I will kill you. She actually said it. And I've spoken to the, I forgot his name, I've spoken to the person who actually took the call. And um, he said, I laughed my head off. Your mum was a feisty, feisty scouser. Um, <laughs> and I've got another little story, which we'll, we'll, I'll talk when we talk about going back to 40 Commando, uh, mm. uh, 40 Union um, last week, when I met Colonel Vaux. It's quite a fun, funny story. 
But yeah, so basically, um, I didn't go with uh, M Company, which was really a massive disappointment to me because we were the Mighty Munch. I'd only been there a few days, but M Company was the Mighty Munch, and um, I loved being in that company. And so, when you say they sent you to HQ, was that with a view to not go into the Falklands, or was that with a view to go in but being in a safer place? I think what it was, they put me as uh, the GPMG. They actually, I actually went as the Colonel Vaux's um, um, machine gun. Um, as did most of um, headquarters. Uh, I think we had three three machine gunners in the headquarters. Defence troop we went in. Let me, I've just remembered, yeah, we went into defence troop. Um, uh, obviously with the, the Padre as well, which is another story I'll tell you about when we get the Falklands. I've got, I've, uh, my book's going to be quite funny. Um, but yeah, but yeah, so I sent, so I sent uh, with the on with defence troop and then sent down on the Canberra with, um, with the guys down in defence troop, which was a lot of lads who were not auto warfare, warfare trained, a lot of um, experienced corporals, experienced LF, uh, uh, experienced um, Lance corporals, uh, experienced, experienced war marines. And I think also, they didn't tell me, but I think, because um, Colonel Vaux never, ever forgets names. He's just a wonderful man, amazing person. And, and he remember, I'll tell you a story, but he remembered me after 40 years. He even remembered my name. Um, and I think he remembers my name because of what my mother had said. And I think the company saw made him must have rang him. And also, um, he wanted, he was like a father, he, he wanted to make sure that he didn't want to lose any of his youngsters. So mm. I'm, coming, I'm going to keep him next to me, close to me, and um, look after him because I'm, I was, obviously I was young. Brilliant. Kind of the youngest uh, Royal Marine. I get told I am, I was. And sometimes somebody said, no, there's somebody younger, but it doesn't really matter. We all went down there. I definitely went there a boy and I definitely came back a man. And how did you get down there, Davey? Oh, on that beautiful thing called the White Whale, SS Canberra. And uh, when you talk about, when you say about how did you feel, was you proud um, on the Canberra until the Belgrana was sunk, we just had one hell of a party. We didn't even think we were going to go to war. We just, and I thought, this is great. It's just one race. This is brilliant life. On the cruise with a big cinema, you know, obviously helicopter um, lost a pool. Fancy taking a pool off us, but they looked, we lost a pool because they put the helicopter pad on, on one of the pools. But um, yeah, we just had a fantastic time going down. I think the, 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 um, the only mistake they made, the MOD, was they put uh, they put um, 40 commando, 4-2 commando on the, whether we were on the, the bottom deck and middle deck or vice versa, but they put, they put uh, the powers at the top deck. Shouldn't have put us on the same ship because we had some battles of them on the way down. Mm. Um, they should never, never have put Royal Marines and power troops together. But yeah, that's, that's another story. Yeah, we leaping forward a bit, there was a, I think there was a few upsets on the way back as well, wasn't it? Because of the blue, because of the blue and blue, blue on blues. Yeah. Not, yeah. I, I'm not saying this was the Paris now. I think uh, it, 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 certainly the SAS. Yeah. Um, well, we even we even had a blue on blue on our own, didn't we? In four five. Four which, five, yes. Which I found out about when I went back, um, thirty five on the thirty fifth anniversary, uh, when I went back as a guest of honor. Um, we got told the, the story. Which happened with four or five, which is absolutely horrendous. Yes, yes, we've had Ad- Andy very bravely on the podcast to, to yeah. um, I'll, I'll put the Falklands uh, playlist below, folks, so you can, um, um, you know, you can check out all our Falklands podcasts. But uh, yes, that was um, that, okay. that that was a tragedy, a tragedy. But but it's war, isn't it? And these 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 things these things happen so um and we should give a shout out davy as well shouldn't we because they don't really often get a mention is that these were civilians on these man in these ships well as soon as you started saying that i thought he's gonna say the civilians because what a fantastic there was over 400 of them on our ship apparently i read that the other day and i was like well we never one to 400 and then we had bertie or bernie or something bertie and bernie who were uh, two um Homosexuals, they were funny guys, empire, but they looked after us. Yeah, they really did. 
Yeah. I I, uh, I think um, when you guys went, or when the unit went ashore, uh, Cameron March left them with a GPMG. <laughs> and they were like, how, yeah. do we, how do we defend the ship, Cam? He's like, yeah. right, take this fucker. <laughs> no. Okay. But, but they did. It they did. did. Yeah. One, one chap, I think was on the MV Nor- Norland. So the, the ship, the paras went down on. Yeah. Shot a bloody albatross. Yeah. 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 You I uh, actually read that, that book about them going down on the, they had some fun as well. The paras on the way down. Yes. My gosh. Uh, big shout out to Wendy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Wendy, one of the, one of the st- stewards. What a, what a, what a cracking bloke. Yeah. Yes, bloke, folks. You you yeah, bloke, you yeah, you, yeah. you do the mass, but what what a lo- what a lovely individual. And he was he was um uh, he was you know very attached to the to the men, wasn't he? You know. So when we went down on the Canberra, um, I was put into a cabin. This this is um, but obviously I've just come out of training, and I, I, I'm doing everything as I'm supposed to do. Everything I'm told to do, I do because. Um, these are all sweats, and I'm just somebody who's in Ed. I've gone from M Company, where I didn't know anybody's name. I'm now in headquarters defence tube, where I don't know people's names. Um, and I'm put into this room with this huge, huge bloke called Taff Cooper. And um, he's massive, and he, and he says to me, you're going on the top, and I wasn't arguing. <laughs> you're going on the top bunk. So I'm on the top bunk, and um, we run, we have to, every day we have to train. So we're running around the camera, and as you will know, and, and the royals know, and civilians may not know, but four towns around the camera was one mile. So we do a four miler. At the end of the four miler, we come back into the cabin. Um, I don't know where Taff was. He, he wasn't doing the the the, the, the PT. He he done. He was gone off somewhere else. And um, I go into the cabin and I take my shorts off, take my socks off, and I wash my socks, and I. And what's the Dolby? We call Dolby now. I Dolby my socks, mm. uh, and I've given them a really good Dolby. And then I get my T-shirt and I give it a really good Dolby. And I'm thinking, I remember um, from CTC, where as you know, a corporal to sixteen in front of a sixteen-year-old lad, fifty-eight of us there was. Just they tell us to go into the heads, into the toilets, and all of a sudden this corporal just takes everything off, strips off, doesn't he? So he strips everything off, and I'm like, what's going on here? This man is just stripped off in front of me. And then he gets in the in and then he starts washing himself, every single bit of himself. He's washing, doesn't he? Even pulling his, his foreskin back and clean behind him. He's going, right. And the other corporal says, um, but what you've just seen Corporal Smith do, Corporal Ryder says, what you've seen Corporal Smith do is wash himself. It's called Dolby. If you don't Dolby like that, we've taught you how to do it. If you don't do that, you get a bass broom in the shower. And you never forget that. So from then on, obviously, I've washed. Like every Royal Marine, I believe every Royal Marine is one of the cleanest people in the world. And um, so basically in this cabin, I washed my T-shirt and socks and I did a good job. And I rinsed them out because you can get Dolby Rash. It's called Dolby Rash, wasn't it? Mm. So you get Dolby Rash if you don't, um, obviously, the, uh, the the Dolby powder, the washing powder. So I get it, and I, as I lift it all up and bring it out, I lift it up, and, it, and I'm thinking, where am I going to put this? You know where to put it. So as I'm hanging it up, I'm thinking, I can't put it there. It, it's now dripping onto Taft's bed. Can't put it there, because I tried to put it over the, the, the mattress thing. So I thought, I'm going to have to just put it back in the sink. So I put it back in the sink. And as I put it back in the sink, I go off to for some scran down the galley. I come back an hour later. As I walk in, as I walk in to the cabin, I hadn't even closed the door. The door was I'm lifted off my feet by one hand by this Taff Cooper, and he rams me against the, the, um, my feet. Uh, uh, and the door slams, and he says to me, you little twat, you crabby little, don't you ever. And, he, and he's holding me one hand, and his other hand is pointing to the sink. And he's going, don't you ever, ever, ever leave Dolby in a sink again I'm going but it was clean it was clean <laughs> it's clean and it nah he would so I learned my lesson and I've never ever ever left any dirty washing dirty dishes I've got a bed at night the, uh, and he's ingrained that into my head but yeah that, that was how I go into my cabin with um, Taff Cooper 
Mate, I still shower like that today. Yeah. The problem I the problem I have is trying to, trying find, to find, find 58 blokes to watch me. <laughs> I thought he was going to say trying to find it then. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that too. That, that's, well, yeah. that's old age for you, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um did you uh did you have to stay on ship? Did you go ashore when when they did the landings? Well, obviously on the way down we did um we did a lot of training and me being GPMG, um, I was then introduced to SF, which is a sustained fire on the tripods. Uh, and we trained and trained and trained and trained. And we had to get it. I think it was under a minute. We had to get the GPMG down, sorted out the, um, the SF kit out of this big bag, big heavy bag, pull it out, tripod bump, set, set up and aimed and ready to shoot. Um, I think there were like brown bags that were blown up and tied and not in and thrown into the water, mm. um, if I remember right. And uh, so we did a lot of training on the way down until we got to Ascension Islands, obviously. And then we were allowed off Ascension Islands to do um, to do some proper fire uh, fire training on the range because there's a range there. And um, unfortunately, um, I forgot what they're called, but they're... They're not ferrets. Oh, what are they called? They're little things that pop their heads up. They, they on the ranges. They got little, those little little holes, and like go gopher sort gophers, of things. Yeah. yeah, and there was a lot of gophers in the sense lines, and a lot of the marines, including myself, I feel terrible now. If a gopher popped his head up, that's probably better to practice training and firing than trying to go at this this the, this thing that's just sat there doing nothing. You know what I mean? So um, we 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 had a, we had to go quite a few golf golfers until one of the um, one of the corporals told us off and told us we weren't allowed to do that. When we were doing Northern Ireland training up at Lid, uh, we were on a range doing a night night shoot, and on the very last shoot of the of the exercise, um, one of the corporals whispers to everyone, "Right on the on 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 the very last shoot, everybody shoot." shoot the left light on the range you know they got like a red light and a white light or something on top of the range to mark like don't fire above above, above it yeah. and um i just remember the range warden walking back carrying this lamp and he's looking at the range controller and he's just going <laughs> and he said he said there's 38 holes in this one and there's 27 in the other <laughs> <laughs> uh, needless to say, some of us ended up in the galley yeah. uh, the next day, <laughs> peeling the potatoes, and I think <laughs> I, I think we yeah. I think we got off lightly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So obviously we stopped off Ascension. Um, uh, we stopped off in uh, uh, Africa as well. So Sierra Leone, we stopped off as well to refuel, and that was that was um, yeah. We stopped off in Sierra, Sierra Leone, and all the all the natives. Um, they, um, for some reason or other, they wanted plastic and pl- there was plastic bottles. When they were asking for plastic, I think they were asking for plastic bottles so that they could fill their water mm. up. Obviously, you see these things about uh, them having to walk across with it and, you know, on their heads and walking miles to go and get water. That always, that always puzzled me that. Why would you walk five miles and go and get water? Why don't you just live next door to the water? But that's another, that's another thing. But it uh, always puzzled me. But obviously... They used to ask for plastic and typical Royal Marines and Paris. I think it was the power that went over the top of the Paris. But we, we were throwing like bottles, but we were trying to wang them onto their heads and things, you know, laughing. But the, we had, a, I think, a power just threw, a, he threw over. They were on plastic and that plastic, so he threw over a, a sun lounger, you know what I mean? And sunk the boat. And we are like, Jesus, what are you like? You know what I mean? It's gone, up, it's gone over the top. But yeah, yeah, we, we got to tell enough for that as well. Because mm. um, they were trying to give us monkeys and and their and their their sisters. You have sister, sister for ten minutes, and I'm trying to get the sisters to come up the side of the the camera into the big, you know, <laughs> big loading uh, door. Crazy just to get uh, some plastic. Yeah, I, I saw a fight broke out when I worked in Mozambique. Um, all the kids came around the back. We were on. We called them shappers, like pickup trucks. Right, you travel everywhere on a on a shapper sh- uh, or, or or you hitchhike. And uh, all the kids come running up and they're like, bottle, bottle. And one of the workers I was with 
like through the bottle and it landed on the floor about five or six kids just started battling for it like this ferocious um we don't know how lucky we are do we uh they used to make footballs davy uh, uh, they get a carrier bag wrap it in a knot yeah wrap another one around it until it got as big as a football and that that was their footballs amazing it was incredible yeah, yeah. so got yeah, a- it was um funny times some sad times going down and then um in the ascension a lot of us got burnt because uh, it wasn't it was organized as in sorting out our training for, for firing weapons but it wasn't organized as in what time is going to get picked up and like listen lads but it's roasting it's absolutely roasting on the ascensions you ain't going to be able to, to get back on the ship make sure you got hats and stuff and um, gee I got a huge blister went right across my forehead um, because we, when we tried to cool down, we thought the only way we we're going to be able to cool down is getting the water, but the water magnifies, so it was even worse. Mm. It, like there was nowhere, there was there was nowhere to sh- you know sort of shelter. So I went back onto the camera with this huge, within hours, and um, there was loads of us lined up outside sick bay, um, you know, getting a getting a right bollocking. Loads of us got a right bollocking, you know, for not taking. We just went with short sleeves and thought it's roasting you in, but. We were there for something like eight hours, mm. nine hours. And how did you get ashore? Or did you, did you, uh, did yeah. you go ashore? Did you stay on the ship? Yeah, um, basically, um, got to um, just before we got to um, exclusion zone. Um, we were told that um, we were told that uh, talks were going on between. The Americans and the British and Argentinians, he was flying, Haig, I think it was his name, Haig. I think he was flying all over the place and he was trying to sort it out. We wouldn't have to, we wouldn't have to, uh, you know, land and hopefully turn around. Um, and I think it was an excuse. I think what they were trying to do, um, we, we kept saying, I'm sure we've just turned around or we've just done a huge circle. And we kept getting told, no, no, we're doing, um, um, zigzagging, we're doing uh, mm. anti-submarine drills, but we, we were sure we, we, we were uh, we were just turning around because it took eight. I can't remember how long it took, but it took weeks and weeks to and weeks to get down the Falklands. I don't know if I'm right, but I'm sure it might, might have been nine weeks. But it did take a long time to get down there, and um, and then just before we got to, through the ex- exclusion zone, the, the zigzag started getting better, and we were like, "Whoa, this ain't." This is this is definitely, and then we found out the Belgrano would uh, been sunk, and that's when my my mindset didn't change. It didn't think, oh, we're definitely going to war because I thought, right, we've given one now. They're probably going to say, sod this. They'll get off the islands and they'll go. It wasn't until obviously um, Sheffield went, and that's when it was like, whoa, this is it, mate. You know, get get your head on. This is this is for real, mate. Especially when you hear about. Um, you know the lads uh, being killed, and so uh, when we when we got to San Carlos, um, I think it was the night of the twenty first. We got off San Carlos, and I was young, right? So yeah, you have to bear with me. And there's some things that my way of dealing with things they're in my head, and they stay in there. End of they ain't coming out. So twenty first. Not the 21st, we got to San Carlos with the white whale. And we're thinking, Jesus, what a target this is. And 40 commando, I think it was 40, and four or five got off at San Carlos. Could be wrong, but I'm sure that that's where they got off at San Carlos. And as they were getting off, HMS Ardent was sunk. And the doors opened. And I remember I was I was packing stuff and helping the lads to pack. Uh, and packing my bergen, make sure I've got all my stuff. And all of a sudden, as I'm bending down, somebody smashed into me and I turned around, turned around thinking, any chance, mate? Not only for that. And, they, and I thought, Adam, they're in a, they're in, they're, you know, they're, they're in a rush here. So all of a sudden, we're all we could hear is, mind the doors, mind the doors. Get out of the way, mind the doors. I'm thinking, right. So but they open the door and uh, I'll never forget, um, this boat comes, see, boat comes and picks, picks up um, the survivors or some survivors of HMS Arden. So it was HMS Arden. And um, they come in and we, that's the first time I've seen Navy lads. Uh, and 
right? When you were a kid, you used to watch a film, uh, the old films, like the submarine films, and you'd have um, the submarine and submariners, and they'd have a um, white woolly pulleys, wouldn't they, with, with um, Polnick. And that was the first time I'd ever seen them for real. Um, and this lad comes up, and he comes in. And as he comes in, he's just soaked, and he's dripping wet, his, his jumper. And uh, I looked at him, and as he walked past me, he just said, go get the bastards royal. And I remember, and I said, and I, it, I just blurted out, I went, yeah, no problem, mate. And uh, as he went past, I remember thinking, what the fuck can I do with a 17-year-old, a fucking eight stone five, you know what I mean? What the fuck am I going to do? Um, poor fucker. And, uh, and then off they went, and they obviously got them all wet and dried them out and stuff there. Uh, 40 and four, five were then let off. And then I believe we went round to Port San Carlos and we get we got off at Port San Carlos and obviously me being with headquarters, um, you're not gonna let the Condon officer or, or you know or the 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 high ranking off first. You're gonna make sure you've you've sorted everything's on the land ready and then so we went um not last but we went in the night early hours of the morning from like four or five in the morning of the twenty third I think. I could be wrong on the date, but about the 20, 22nd. Um, but we went round to Port San Carlos because apparently it was a better, there was more um, sort of hills and there was less chance of the the the, the Argentinian uh, jets getting getting the turn, getting the Canberra. Mm. So, yeah, so we landed and then straight away started digging in. Started digging in and me and a lad called Smudge. And funny enough, I've only just found out his real name first name five days ago because obviously I've gone from M company I don't know people's names to, to defence tube and I'm giving this lad called Dan Smith brilliant at maths unbelievable at maths 16 multiple 16s say to Dan Smith what's 365 times times 16 and he go within a three seconds boom and give you the answer um, and 65 times 16 give it I don't, I don't know how he did it but but he smoked like a trooper, and, I, and I've always been. I hated smoking, so um, I was like, but I couldn't say nothing because I'm 17. I mean, he, and he, he's a bit older than me. And um, so we go down, we and we um, we dig our trench, and as we're digging our trench, we're all ready and we've got the trench going well. And we were lucky because most trenches filled up after your first attempt with water. So we're lucky, and I said to Smudge, "How long we're t- how long we're going to be here for?" And he says. I don't know. I said, I'll tell you what. So we just keep digging. So we kept digging and we made ourselves a little sleeping area. So we had the sleeping area and we had the place where you could stand. And then we started digging again, made it bigger, where we could put steps so that we could step up to shoot or if we had to shoot, which we did after, um, after five, six hours, got attacked by the jets. Uh, and then we could step down and be undercover, so to speak. And then we thought, and then, so we dug it uh, uh, like this, this little air sleeping area. And then he says, let's have a little, so we, we dug this brilliant trench. It was brilliant. And the way the Padre come past, and he's going, hi lads. I'm like, oh, sir. And he says, nice trench. We lost that trench in about three hours, uh, three or four minutes. The trench went, you two out. <laughs> we had to go and dig another trench. So we dug another trench and I'm, I'm sure the Padre pinched it and might even been the CEO as well, or one of the officers, but we lost our trench. So we dug another trench and started digging. And it filled up within 15 minutes of war. I don't believe this. So we dug another trench uh, and we were able to dig another trench, but we gave up. We just said, uh, so we dug a trench and we just both cuddled each other and cuddled each other when it was freezing cold. But yeah, but I lost, we lost our trench. We were gutted, me and Smudge. But um, yeah, but then obviously we, um, um, through the day, they found out where we were as well. And we started getting, um, um, I don't think we were getting attacked. I think they were going across to, obviously, San Carlos, where the where the guys were and all the stuff was being taken off and all our stuff. So basically, there was jets just flying all over the place. And uh, you just tried your best with GPMGs, um, you know, put it three or four inches in front of the jet and hopefully it went through. But you'd have to, you'd have to hit straight through the, through the screen and, and try and hit him. But so it, it was a... Wasn't pointless, but you know we tried our best uh, in the first few days and just watched all the, all, the, all the ships getting attacked and the, 
RF, the, the, RF, the, the Navy lads. So brave. Sitting ducks. Unbelievable. Yes, it is. It is. And uh, as the Welsh Guards found out to their cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a different story, isn't it? Yeah, we had si- Simon Weston on the show and uh, yeah. just um, yeah. awful, awful. Yeah, it is. It is but it, it, it's a sore point with the Marines, the, the Welsh Guards, I'm afraid. And uh, yeah, you can't blame the you can't blame, blame the, the soldiers. You have to blame somebody. I mean, we won't name him, but we have to command an officer of Welsh Guards who thought it was better for him to yeah, I, I do. catch up. I do remember seeing a, a documentary and there was a Royal Marines officer who was Scott in charge. So, so there'd be Taylor. Well, well, yeah, po- could could possibly be, but but he was like incandescent that they wouldn't get off and he w- he'd been screaming at them like, you've got to get off, you've got to get off. But- Captain Sotheby Taylor, I met him um, five, five or four years ago after Sergeant Blackman thing. Uh, I met him there and um, he insisted that they had to get off. You must get off your sitting duck. Uh, so the, Mr. Sotheby Taylor, he actually volunteered um, to go down the Falklands 10 years before and he was fantastic at uh, sailing, yachtsman things, and he plotted every single route to go down the Falklands. So he knew everything about the Falklands and he, mm-hmm. he, he told them, but they wouldn't get off. Or not sorry, the lads wouldn't get off. He wouldn't take his men off. Um, but obviously, we, we can talk about that later. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah. So basically, we um, we just waited until we, we were told to move, and then we started moving towards uh, Stanley. Then I think we went to Teal Inlet first. Um, I could be wrong, but we definitely within five six days we caught a pilot, um, and obviously being headquarters. And um, this pilot was sent to headquarters. Um, and I think somebody would probably say, no, he wasn't there, but I think it was Teal Inlet. And in Teal Inlet, in, in that, um, he had, um, um, he had, a, he had a, somebody put a, a thing around his, like a bandana over his eyes, uh, so he couldn't see any of us or counters or things like that. And he was just sent into this, um, it was like shed, like a sheep shed or something. But he was sent there and he was in, Interrogated apparently, uh, but apparently, fair to assume he didn't say anything. <laughs> so, got on him, so we didn't interrogate him enough. But apparently, he kept his mouth shut and didn't say anything. But that was the first time I'd seen one of them, so to speak. Um, so, 4 2 Commando was it Mount Harriet, Mount Kent, or was it the other way around? Yeah, yeah Mount, Mount Kent, Mount um, Harriet. In mm. fact, um, I think because obviously I was headquarters, then you had L Company and K Company with us. Um, was doing Mount Kent first, uh, but I think the SAS, if I'm not right, I think but the SAS went up and there wasn't that much um, to do up Mount Kent. They, they, they'd done a runner hmm. already. Maybe seen how many there was. And, I mean, they'd been there for three months. It was cold, wasn't it? Freezing cold, man. So how oh, they stuck it in three months in the, in the train. They's probably worried, Davey, he's going to go up there and hang all your dirty doby everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I, I think there's Teal Inlet I went first and then I went into Mount Kent, one of the worst. I don't know if Jeff Williams, I think Jeff did a podcast, didn't you, mate? Yeah, Jeff's been on the show. Yeah, incredible. Freezing. Oh, the coldest I've ever been in my life, I think, for four days. And I think Colonel Vaux actually went and told the hierarchy that if you don't get my men off this um, mountain in the next 24 hours, we are seriously looking at some, some dead Royal Marines. I need to get them off. We had no, we had no, um, um, no kit. The Bergens hadn't come forward because obviously Atlantic conveyor had been, um, Atlantic conveyor had been uh, sunk, and there was only one uh, Chinook left, which was Bravo November two. Which is, I've sat in that. I'm very proud to say I've sat in it. I've actually watched it in the 35th anniversary when I went down to the Falklands when I went back, and I've actually sat in it. And um, and now it's in around the corner for me in RF Cosford. Mm. Nice to retire it. Um, so yeah, um, like, like Jeff said when he said it's so cold, freezing cold. Um, we were at Mount Kent, and I was asked. Is another thing I was telling tell, you know what I said to you. You listen to everything you're told by your training team. It, it's inbred. Um, I was asked, me and Smudge, to go and put a tripler 
one of them, um, one of the one of the edges of um, um, Mount Kent. So me and Smudge went off to do this trip flare, uh, and Smudge said, "What do you want to do?" I said, "I said you stick the um, you stick the peg in." Uh, if people don't know what a trip flare is. Basically, it's a peg that you unravel, stick on the end, you pull the pin out, and if they walk into it, it obviously goes off the flare, and we can obviously mount an attack on. Um, so he put a st- uh, up. He said, "I'll stay here." So he, still, Smudge was about got to have been thirty five foot up in the air. Uh, on this cliff, keeping an eye on me to make sure that you know nobody came and I wasn't attacked or some sneaky beaky argies were about. So I put the peg in the ground, and then I undone the peg, undone the, um, the trip flare, and I and then I put it, I put it down to the ground. And as I put it in the ground, I remember the corporal PW, PW corporal training saying to me, "I need shoulders out to do it. Whatever you do." When you're pulling the pin out, for God's sake, make sure you, you lie down as low as you can. You put your, your, you put your arms covering your face and away, and you grab all the pin and you, you pull the pin out slowly, obviously, away in case it, it goes off by accident. So I remember thinking that as I was doing it, and I'm thinking, that's what the corporal told me to do. I've got to make sure I do it right. Um, so as I was doing it, it must have been trapped on a piece of rock or something, and it went off. Bang, straight in my face, a white foss. And uh, Smudge spotted it straight away. He jumped 35 foot straight next to me and sunk into the into the ground because it was Pete. It was horrendous, wasn't it? Obviously, a lot of people with trench foot. And he sunk in the ground. He got out and he just and he undone his water bottle and he just sort of thrown it all over my head. And he'd done that within four, five seconds, 10 seconds. And um, basically, nothing happened to me, but so close to obviously being Kazirak straight away. And all I remember thinking is, you fucking idiot, you idiot, you just give us away. Um, but obviously the RGs still thought the Argentinians were still up there, so they probably just thought, oh, it's our lads. And nothing happened, but I was... I was nobody ever came up to me afterwards and went, fucking give me a slap. I was expecting a slap from, you know, somebody. But nobody gave me a slap, no corporal come on, no, no sergeant, you know, said, what the fuck are you doing? Um, but I think it may be because because it was down the dip and it was away. It was quite far away from where we were camped at the time, and maybe because we were all fucking freezing cold and you know just give a shit. But it was cold up Mount Kent, and then Colonel Vaux got us all moved. I'll keep calling him Colonel Vaux because now apparently he's a um, maybe Major General Vaux now. But yeah, but yeah, he got us moved off Mount Kent and then obviously head headed forward then towards um, Mount Harriet. Yes. My gosh. Did you, did you have another flare? No, no chance. There's no, no way in the world I was doing it. Then yeah. again, um, but yeah, but, but, but obviously if we go to obviously the Yompin across because of all the Chinooks that have been sunk, um, we we're, we we're supposed to obviously get um, um, sent across on, on the Chinooks. To get there quicker, so that that put us back about. I think it put us back a couple of weeks, didn't it? Um, so we had to jump, and then um, honestly, I was eight stone six, maybe nine stone now because I've uh, yeah, three months more Marines eat like they just don't stop eating, do they? So I'd put quite a bit of pounds, so I'd probably about nine stone, but I had a Bergen, my Bergen was got to have been 80. Under pound, my webbing, which is twenty five pound, my GPMG, which weighs twenty six pound. I had um, two sixty sixes, six grenades, two thousand rounds, um, and a spare barrel, which means spudge swapped. We kept swapping, and the handle of the SF means smudge, and we yumped from there to Tlenle, from Tlenle to to. Um, um, Mount Kent, but in between Tilenla and Mount Kent, we we lost all our stuff. I think because obviously we thought something was going to happen at Mount Kent, so we lost our Bergens. We, our Bergens were taken away and stuff, and we were just left with was fighting order and enough rounds and the GPMG and things and smudge obviously with his SLR. And then when we got to Mount Kent, we didn't have anything, so we were freezing. 
we were expecting to take Mount Kent and then the stuff would be sent over. And I think did Jeff in his podcast, uh, he did actually say that him and the guys had to go back, didn't they, to go and get all our kit? Yeah, they were, did they go back in a BV or something? Back in the BVs, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. yeah, funny story about him thinking he was going across the water and stuff. But yeah, so I have to thank Jeff Williams for, for, for bringing us some food and bringing us um, some warm clothing and mm. docks and things. And so when we got to Mount Kent, we were then washed and changed and, you know, dried off and felt brilliant or felt as good as we could. Um, and then, I don't know about you, but since then, since that five, four nights, five days in uh, Mount Kent, I, my wife says to me, how the hell have you got a asbestos mouth? Because we must have drank tea after tea after tea, trying to keep warm. Shit, like, I was up freezing. Your, your, your fingers were stuck to the cup. Um, and I drank red hot tea as if it was just cold water. And then when I come home now, and some of the guys, I don't drink tea anymore now, but I used to. I used to say, do you want a cup of tea? Yeah. And within, by the time they turn and put their sugar in, mine's gone. They're like, bloody hell, mate, asbestos mouth. I always say to them, it's ever since that, that four days, five nights on, mm. four, four nights, five days on, on Kent. And then obviously we then um, got off Kent, which is so, <laughs> I met, oh, chuffed a bit to where, but then it was um, head, head towards Mount, Mount Harriet then. How was the attack on Kent then? What, did it, do I... Fair, to be fair, I don't know, because apparently Mount Kent, when they got there, the SAS, um, there might have been some of, um, um, we haven't mentioned Juliet Company, have we? Um, uh, you had K Company, L Company, and there was no such thing as J Company in them days. And it's quite surprising that I've talked to some serving members now, and they know, Gen, they know J Company now, but they don't realise that J Company actually comes from the Falklands. It was actually set up on the way down to the Falklands, uh, and consisted of um, MP8901 lads, the original lads that yeah, um, yeah. laid down their arms, did not surrender. Let's get that right. Um, and basically, um, J Company then became MP8901 because they knew that the ground and headquarters uh, and dribs and drabs. And, and I actually was put with a J Company, I can't remember what for, for a few days. That was another thing I'm thinking, oh, I've come from M Company, I don't know anybody. I'm in defence too, I don't know anybody. And now they put me in J Company and I'm like, for me, these lads, geez. I remember Lou Armour being there. I, I can't remember where I seen him, but I remember him being there because I remember him um, thinking he's seen his face and thinking, no, you was that bloody lad who had your hands in the air, the, the, the first one, wasn't it? When mm -hmm. the bloody, that rag, the sun put surrender on the front. Um, yeah, yeah, a lot of people, friends at home, a lot of people don't know it wasn't a surrender. It was... Uh... Well, they laid down. Not, not, not that would have been a, would have been a bad thing to surrender because yeah, it was a, it was a good thing to you know to, it it would have been suicide and like it would just be stupid. A lot of them were fathers with kids at home, just yeah. to die needlessly would have been stupid. But it was actually a, a Rex Hunt, Governor Rex Hunt, Sir Rex Hunt, yeah. negotiated a ceasefire. Yeah. Now, yeah. if you keep firing after a ceasefire, you're a fucking knob. Yeah. <laughs> Plus. Plus, you're going to get sent to uh, military prison for a, yeah. a a very long time. So, yes, you're quite right to point that out, Davey. Yeah. And um, so let me get this right. So was it Mount Harriet after Mount Kent? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and what what happened? What, what role did you play in Harriet? We right, in, in Mount Harriet, um, obviously, we were told as machine gunners and we were defence troops. Uh, and then all of a sudden, I I I were, was either taken away from I can't remember. I was either taken away from um, defence ship or I was, I was or we all became part of it. But um, our job or my job with Smudge was to um, take up uh, take up a position uh, at the bottom of um, Mount Harriet to to the side, so to speak. So you so we're here at the side. They've then got I think it was K Company on the start line. Uh, gone to the front and then L Company come up and our, our job was to keep the heads down What one obviously keep quiet and obviously get K Company as close, as close as they could but as soon as as soon as um, as soon as um, any firing started um, and I we spotted it our job was to, to 
wherever it was, to just keep firing at that non-stop until it stopped and you either got them or they'd moved. Uh, were you were you in the SF role now? Uh, yeah, I went into SF. I stuck in, we stuck into SF role. I even mm. thought, because there was a couple of... Um, a uh, couple of close ones. I even thought of taking my lace because I had spare laces. I even thought, you know, it sounds stupid, but I even thought of taking my lace out because it wouldn't move this SF. It was, it was solid. I even thought of taking my lace out um, instead of sticking my head up and, and, and actually tying a lace and then pulling it five, three or four, you know, because obviously when you, fight it, when you fire a GPMG, it's only a burst of five, six rounds. You don't, because you burn the barrel out or you have to keep swapping the barrel. So, um, I even thought of just tying the lace and just have a go, lock it onto where I need to lock it. Bum, 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 bum. Have a look. As he stopped, lock. And I even thought of doing that. I thought, I would, I would go on to my mum, you know what I mean? But um, before Mount Harriet, we had we had loads and loads of kit. And that's when we walked through that minefield due to um, the Welsh Guards not turning up or got lost. Um, so we ended up um, walking through a minefield um, and as we were in the middle of the minefield, waiting for two engineer lads, are they two nine or five nine? I always, I always get the wrong way around. Five nine, nine, five nine of the engineers, two nine of the gunners. Yeah, see, I got it wrong way around again. Typical, uh, but obviously we had to wait for the engineer, two engineer lads, um, and all of a sudden we're we're yomping across, and we hear um, halt, 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 and everybody's halting. We're like, what's going on? What's going on? And all of a sudden it comes back, whispering comes back. Um, we're in a minefield and you're like, you're having a fucking laugh. How the fuck have we got in here? And we're in a long minefield. So um, I've got me, I've got my Bergen on and I've got like loads of kit. And um, I, um, I'm in this minefield with smudge and we're thinking we're tired. So we, t- we, we try and, bend down to get the, the, the weight off our shoulders. So you try and you stand up and you sort of lean forward as best you can. And in the end, and we're told not to move, do not move, you know what I mean, until these lads come to the front. Um, we were so tired that I just wanted to sit down. I was knackered, absolutely knackered. So I said, so much, I'm sitting in down, man. And so I just took a chance, stupidly. I t- that's what I did was I just... Um, squatted down and then the weight of my Bergen sort of knocked, knocked me back and I, I was waiting for the bang to see obviously and then there was nothing there I was like so I was just lay down undone my straps and just lay there and then um, I, I don't know how long it was for but all of a sudden we could hear a commotion behind this and it was these two engineering lads and they, they'd come past us uh, and as I went past us I said good luck lads can better you than me you know what I mean good luck lads and they went, cheers, mate. And so they carried on. And then all of a sudden, um, we heard, right, ready to move, ready to move. We're like, fucking hell, they've, they've obviously got in front. So I'll never forget, Smudge, I tightened me, 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 um, me straps up and I tried to get up and I kept trying to get up. I just couldn't get up. The weight just couldn't get up. So what I did is well, I turned, I turned and I, I got on me, on me, my knees. when the play was putting the five hands feet on the floor with the head and then um, I tried to get up that way but it, I couldn't I couldn't get up so what I did was I said to, to Smudge do me a favour mate um, can you stand on my feet uh, so I basically got him to stand on my feet and then he, he pulled me up and we got I eventually got up um, I looked and I, we'd lost about, about 10 yards I was shitting myself then because when it, it came back Whatever you do, stand in the same footprint of the lad in front. You know what I mean? So I felt a twat then because I'm thinking, Fucking you, you, you've lost him. And, you know. So um, I, I quickly caught him up uh, and I grabbed all the back of um, the lad's webbing uh, and just watched. Clo- I closed my eyes because obviously in the Roman range we were taught cylindrical and um, not to lose um, our sight. You can lose your the darkness was within... Yeah, your night vision. If you can use your night vision within milliseconds. So when you're on patrol, we used to close one eye, didn't we? And if a car vehicle came, so that we still had night vision. Uh, and silly things you remember, isn't it? So I'm thinking, um, close your eyes for 10 seconds. And when I'm open up, I can, I can, you can see better. I don't know why. I just So I remember closing my eyes for 10 seconds. 
and losing him again for a couple of seconds and grabbing hold of him again. And, and I could see better, so I could see his footprints better. And I remember thinking, I've got to make sure I get the footprints better. So I was I was doing the footprints, but I was banging my feet in hard because I wanted to make sure Smudge behind me could see my footprint because it was dark. And the other lads could see my footprints. Um, and then as we are heading towards um, Mount Harriet, one of the best firework displays I've ever seen in my life. They're obviously, HMS Yarmouth, if I ever meet any of them guys, I'll give them a big hug because they must have pummeled Mount Harriet for at least an hour and a half. I was thinking, how the fuck are they going? Where's all that? Where's all the weapons? Where's all the missiles coming from? Can you imagine an hour and a half of non-stop? No, 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 uh, no, non-stop, no stop, just boom, 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 boom. And I was thinking, and the and the firework display, fucking unbelievable. And I was thinking, mate, Argy, if you're up there, you ain't you ain't getting out of that. But there's going to be nothing there for us to do. So for an hour and a half, they absolutely pummeled them. And obviously, what they would do was was uh, softening them up and keeping their heads down to make sure they couldn't see us sneaking around, sneaking around the back is what we were doing. Uh, oh, apologies. What we were doing we were sneaking around the back. Colonel Volks wanted us to sneak around the back and come around in exactly where they didn't want us to be. And, uh, yeah, that the carnage, the carnage that the, uh, the heavy guns can create is just, well, it, off a ship, you know, I mean, the bad, what is it, the 155 millimetre on the artillery, they're bad enough, but off a ship, phew, unbelievable, unbelievable. But they did survive, didn't they? And, and well, they did, yeah, because obviously we, we, uh, we, had to, uh, we had to take them all, or sorry, K Company, L Company and J Company. Mm. Uh, and then, um, like I said, we, we were firing. Once, once, once uh, one of the lads was, was seen, Kate, I don't know if it was Kate or Help Company, one of them was seen, all of a sudden parachute flares went up and then that was it. All, all, that's when I definitely seen the best firework display and I've ever seen him. Was life. that when the lad, lad from L Company stood on a mine? Um, I don't know because, it, do you know what, there's different, there's different stories about, about what happened to him, but I, I, I think it might have been. Um, he stood on a mine, um, a flare went up from the RGs and then that was it. As soon as the flare went up, they could see us all potent. They could, see, I could, well, I could see all our lads all over the place, and it was like they sort of took cover and then started doing the, doing the, um, doing the attack. And then obviously we couldn't do anything. Then I felt helpless. But basically, I tried to fire at them up there until I thought K Company or got too close. Or, or the, you know the lads were getting to, and then I just had, we just stopped and sort of stood and you know, sat and watched the best firework display I've ever seen in my life. Mm. Unbelievable! How long did it take to capture the mountain? Um, well, it was supposed to be eleven. I think it was eleven o'clock on the start line for K Company, uh, but due to the Welsh Guards getting lost and not turning up at all, uh, they were found by I think they were found by J Company. Um, later on, but I think one of the roles told them to go and fucking do one, do you know what I mean? Because um, we weren't too happy with them. Um, so um, I think we didn't, the start line didn't go till about one in the morning. I mean, we were expecting to 11 o'clock and then maybe have it finished. And I don't know what Colonel Vokes wanted, what his plan was. Um, but it was quite funny because I can't remember the names of his daughters, but um, two parts of the top of Mount Harriet were named after his daughters. Mm. Operation K Company and maybe had Operation, um, I don't know what her name was, uh, and then K L Company had Operation so and so. But yeah, um, I read in the book that they were named after his daughters. But yeah, I, I think it took, we'll put it this way, by midday next morning, uh, the event, the, the Argentinians, no, by, by eight o'clock in the morning, the, the, the Argentinians were starting to come down, um, which was another story because they wouldn't come down first. They told that if they get caught by the Royal Marines, we we're gonna we we're gonna eat them. <laughs> but we we're gonna shoot them or we'd eat them. We'd interrogate them, shoot them and eat them. Obviously, the Argentinian um, officers tell them these fucking ridiculous things. So they wouldn't come down. Um when they eventually come down, and um we had a 
we had dribs and drabs, and then we had Jay Company bringing loads down. Uh, and then it was my um, my job with Defence Troop uh, to put the prisoners of war at the bottom of Mount Harriet on a track. Um, we stuck them on the track and we and um, and then we called them forward and then stuck them in another part of the track uh, and we searched them. And um, there's a picture of me in Battle for the Falklands uh, somewhere and the video in the Battle for the Falklands. Uh, Sergeant Brian Evans was our sergeant in uh, defence troop. And there's a picture of him, and you may have seen it. Um, he's got he's got his SMG, his green berry on, and he's knelt down and he's he's sort of uh, and he's sort of pointing to an RG who's, who's sat down on the track. And behind him, you've got um a lad, I forgot his name, I was told it yesterday, funny enough, stood next to me, green berry on, searching an RG. And me stood next to him with no berry on. And the reason I didn't have my berry was what really fucking I was threaders was because I lost it going to try and bring down one of the lads from, I think he was K Company, who got injured. And I could hear him screaming. Yeah, he was definitely 100% K Company. Um, and basically I found out afterwards, his name was Ian Vincent, Jan Vincent. And what had happened was he'd been shot through both eyes and then he was he was the radio operator, the K company, or one of the sections. And apparently the round had gone through both his thighs and it hit his two IC or their two IC uh, in the in the section of the company. His name was Stafford and he was in the Highland, he was from the Highlanders. And I, I always remember talking to the K company lads, and they all said, if ever that lad from the Hollanders should have been a Royal Marine. They, they, they fought the world of him. Brilliant, brilliant bloke. And he'd been shot with the same round and he'd gone through the ankle. And um, I just heard screams of uh, fucking coming out, coming out. So I left me weapon and I ran to Jan Vincent and, and I grabbed him as the, as the fire and just all, the, all this battle's going on. And I grabbed hold of him and he put his left arm, I think smudged, got his, on his right arm, I had his left arm and we were dragging him and the rounds were flying everywhere and we thought, fucking hell. And, and then all of a sudden he, we tripped and fell over and as we fell over, um, he knocked my fucking berry off and I grabbed hold of him and dragged him again and we dragged him down to the bottom I got him, and then I didn't see him again. I've never seen him since. Um, but I found out his name was Ian, Jan Vincent, Ian Vincent. In fact, it was, um, it was, um, Jeff Williams actually told me his name. He said, yeah, I remember Jan really well. Great fella. Um, and I lost my berry and I was so fucking pissed off because I lost, it was only three months old. I'd only just passed out in December. So it was, it was obviously three or four months old and I was fucking annoyed. So I lost my berry. And I thought, I can't believe this. So there's pictures of me searching Argentinians at the bottom of Mount Harriet with no berry. And it winds me up because, yeah, I never, I never did get my berry. I contacted Jan Vincent probably seven years ago. And, um, did he have, have it? Sorry? Did he have it? No, he didn't have it, but he's a Man United fan and I'm a Scouser, I'm a Liverpool fan and then um, we ate Man United and then um, first thing he said was, F off, you're a Liverpool fan. <laughs> I said, oh, thanks for that, mate. But um, he wasn't at the 40th reunion, I was able to see him, but I did see second lieutenant um, Stafford and I walked up to him from M Company where I was marching and we finished and walked up to him he was the only one with the Highlanders hat on. I thought, it's got to be him. It's got to be us all up. And I just said to him, excuse me, sir, you were, or was you second lieutenant Daphne? He went, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, I I've never met you before, but I was the, your radio operator, Jan Vincent. He went, oh yeah, Van, Jan, I was in myself. I never met him. I said, but I, I helped Jan and obviously the other lads helped you to get down. He, How are you? And he was like, hey, I'm good. And so that was how I met him the other day. So obviously at the end of, um, the Mount Harriet, it was just, it was just a um, search of prisoners and then we'd have little dribs and drabs come down, ones and twos. And this is a crazy story, this, but um, we started getting bombed by the RGs. Obviously, we were, they've heard that we've taken Mount Harriet. So they start um, bombing us with a 155 millimetre artillery guns, I think they were. And they start bombing us. Um, and so we got told, 
whatever you do, do never, ever, ever get in a fucking trench that was an RG's trench. Because if they were as professional as us, I think it was one of the sergeants told me, he said, if they were professional as us, they would have took, they've got three months to take every single coordinate map reading of every single trench. Mm-hmm. Now, if we jump in the fuckers, we're, we're dead. So you've got to drill, you've got to, you have to dig your trench and you're going to have to, we ain't got time, you're going to have to drill a, a digger, a shell scrape. So we, uh, we were digging shell scrapes, all that as we were digging shell scrape, or just hiding as we were getting, uh, as we were getting, you know, it's counter-attacked. Or we thought we were. They, were, they were just firing rounds at us. Um, all the lads came, Company company Juliet and ourselves were just taking cover anyway, rocks. And then we decided digging there. So me and Smudge dug, um, I don't know where we got the, the, to be fair, I don't know where we got the, um, the spade from because we, we didn't know our spades. We, some of us didn't have a spade. I must have got it from somewhere. I tried to dig a trench, uh, a shell scrape, but by the, by the road, it was rock hard. So what we ended up doing was just building up rocks. A lot of the lads did just elder up, elding, uh, ended up building rocks and, um, and making sure that we could dive somewhere. And uh, once, once we, um, in between the shelling, we were doing the, uh, the searching. I was digging my shell scrape and I swear to God, I've got a poke on the back. And as I turned around, this fucking Argentinian is handing me his, his, his FN, but like an SLR, wasn't it? He's handing me, and I shit myself. And I screamed out, "What the fuck?" And one of the lads, one of the lads turned and went to shoot at this RG. Um, I think he had an SMG. One of our lads did, and he went to shoot, and I went, "No!" And he, he gave me, it and he just he was shitting himself. The RG, and he just went, you know, and he gave me the gun. I was like, "What the fuck? Where the fuck's he come from?" And, and he just wandered down. Because they were too scared, and he just he just wandered down. He just passed me the weapon, uh, and uh, I passed it on to one of the lads, and somebody took it and put it in the in the dump where the rest of the stuff was. Um, but that, that was that was crazy. I, I thought, how oh, the fuck is he just sneaked up behind me? That's um, pissed me off. Uh, and then um, we started hearing the next the next day um, we got rid of the RGs, the, the prisoner wars. Uh, and we were sleeping in the shell scrapes and uh, we kept getting bombed overnight. And it must have been obviously the, the night of the uh, night of the 12th. We were getting bombed uh, by the RGs. Um, so we just kept taking cover. And I, I remember sitting, lying in me a shell scrape with, with smudge and we tried to cuddle up and keep fucking warm. Um, and um, we were fucking freezing. And these, these rounds were getting closer. Well, it felt like they were getting closer. So I zipped me sleeping clean back up and uh, put it over my head. And I, I thought, I'll, I'll, this will protect me. I'll be all right, nice and warm. I'll just, so I'll stay nice and warm. And they were getting closer and closer. And I thought I felt something, it, it's a rock. And I thought, fuck, that's, that's a smudge got up. And he went, fuck this, I'm getting away from here. I said, smudge, don't move. I said, because it's, you think of silly things, don't you? And I said, to smudge, don't move, because that was close. There's not going to be another one, same place. They're going to put them different places. He was like, nah, so we... He pissed off somewhere about 10 yards away. And it wasn't until in the morning when I woke up and I said, are you all right? And he was like, yeah, we've been bombed overnight. And then um, the next morning, um, we were just hanging around waiting to see what was happening. And I, heard, I heard a vehicle come up the track. And I, I now know it was called, it was a scimitar. Um, Blues and Royals had it or some of that. Or the Pongos had it anyway. And um, as it was coming up the track, Mount, Mount Harris behind me, I'm just looking over the distance. And over the distance, we had our artillery lads um, firing, obviously firing it somewhere, might have been Longdon or Tumble Down. They were trying to help, obviously, the lads who were just about to take Tumble Down and Longdon. Uh, and looking to my left, I heard this vehicle come. I'll never forget it, this vehicle come. And as it come up, it had a salvage sheet like thing wrapped and tied with rope on top of it. And as he got closer and closer, I noticed this hand sticking out like he was like reaching for the sky. And um, as he got closer and closer, I thought, fuck me, it's a, it's a body. And then obviously it was, a, it was a British tank. And I thought, that's got to be a British body because we wouldn't pick up a fucking RG body. We wouldn't have tied him on. 
well, no, this is disrespectful, but we wouldn't have tied him on and made him look like nobody could see him. But because of the bouncing and the, and the track and the road and stuff, it come undone a bit and his arm was like, the, the salvage sheet was down, his hand was sticking in the air. And I remember thinking, now afterwards, he went past, but I wanted to stop him and I was going to get in front and I was going to go, stop, fucking hell, mate, get a grip, just fucking see him, you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? And um, But I didn't and I always regret it and I always think about it and I think, why did I not do that? Why did I not jump out in front and say, fucking hell, mate, that, that's a British soldier, you know what I mean? Um, and I probably put it down to me being just young and, and scared of not being told. Um, you need to go and stop that, you know what I mean? Or if I was an old sweat in my 25, you know, 26, been in years, I'd probably fucking, even if a corporal had said, no, don't do it, I'd probably gone, fuck, fuck, well, mate, fucking do it, I'll fill you in, fill, you know, do something with that body. But I didn't do it, it winds me up that I never, I never did anything about it. Mm-hmm. And I often think, um, who was he? But every... Uh, the 12th, 11th, stroke 12th of um, June, I toast Lofty Watts, who obviously one of our lads who died, um, Smithy, Corporal Smith, who died. And I always toast this lad, but I don't know, I don't know who his name is. Good effort, mate. Just, um, just once a year, though, eh? the rest you got to leave in the, leave in yeah, the past. Yeah, comes out, comes out once a year. And um, yeah, it comes out once a year mm-hmm. and then goes back in the box. But it's got to stay. David, I just want to explain for our friends at home. Uh, we said BV earlier, folks, for those that don't know, it's a snowcat, so a, a track vehicle. And uh, the GPNG in the SF role is a, as opposed to firing it on a bipod and having it in your shoulder and you do all the movement. It's fixed on a tripod and you can just dial in the coordinates and it's incredibly accurate. It, it, it almost becomes, I don't know, three times more lethal. You can pick a rock quarter of a mile away and every single round will hit, hit that rock. In fact, when I was in training, our training team set the GPMG up in the SF role and they got it hitting this rock so what was it one in four's tracer and it was hitting the rock davy and pinging directly upwards ricocheting every round was ricocheting directly up in in uh into the air it's uh, a, sa- a savage uh savage yes. savage bit of kit yeah it's yeah. awesome so what was what came next was that the was that the oh. move into stanley well, the base around right them was um, obviously the 12th. Uh, we were then waiting for any orders. I was just waiting for them to say when they were moving. Uh, and then we were waiting for, I assume we were waiting for um, Longdon, Mount Longdon, um, and tumble down to be taken. And then we'd, we'd obviously move forward. Um, I think three power took Longdon. Um, and basically what happened was over the next couple of days, the, 12th, the 13th and the 14th, um, I can't remember the date Longdon was taken, it might have been the 13th, um, but we were just sort of waiting and um, just just having wets and, you know, cleaning ourselves up, trying to make ourselves better, making sure we had our weapons, looking out for any RGs up the um, Mount Harriet. Another story, Mount Harriet, this one, this one wouldn't come down from Mount Harriet. I th- think it was on the, It'll be on the 12th, midday. They'd all been starting to come down now. And um, this one just wouldn't come down. And I, I think we got one of the artists to shout up, trying to shout up. They probably wouldn't have heard him. Shout up to tell him it's okay, you can come down. We're not going to eat you. Do you know what I mean? And he wouldn't come down. And... Um, so an order came from somewhere that he's got to go because he's because he, he was firing at us. We could hear that. You know, we'd finished Mount Harriet. We, we'd searched them all, and everything's fine. And this little fucker kept firing us. We could hear the ping. You know, when it's getting close, like, what the fuck? Ping. And then somebody said, "I think there's a sniper." So we all had to dive for cover and look. And somebody spotted him, and they said, "Let's take him out." 
crazy. But just just denied it. I think afterwards, all you have to do is come down. You're fucking told to come down. You believe the shit that, you know, your, your officers have told you. When, we, when I was searching an Argentinian at the bottom of Mount Harriet, he came forward and he was probably only, he looked young. Well, I was young, but he looked young. And um, I'd never been taught how, how to search people. So I, I just kept watching the lads either side of me, you know, what to do. They were a bit older than me. And um, I didn't call one forward at first. I wanted to watch for a couple of times to see what he did properly. But I, didn't want, well, I always remember thinking, I've got to make sure fucking, he hasn't got nothing. Do you know what I mean? Make sure every nook and cranny. So I call this lad forward, uh, done a couple. And then I call this one lad forward and I said to him, hands up. And he walks towards the hands up and I, I patted him down his arms and I put my hand down his arms underneath his armpits and um, pat down his front in, in his bollocks and stuff, make sure he ain't got it in the clutch and stuff, all the way down and down his ankles. And I turned him around. As I turned him around, I go down his arms. And I felt something in his back. What the fuck's that? That's not right. So I turned him around. I went to the back and he fucking faced as he went white. So I said, lads, there's something in his back. And um, the lad next to me um, turned the SMG towards him and he decided he shit himself. And I went, no, no, no. And I, said, I turned him back and I lifted his top and he had a big bag of sweets, plastic bag full of sweets, wrapped around this like cloth, brown, really like camouflage cloth stuff. I undone the cloth and pulled this massive bag. It, honestly, it was quite big. And it's full of chocolates, toffees and things. And I looked at it, I turned him around, I went, and he, and he looked at me, and I looked over his shoulder, and his mates, fucking hell, it looks like a kill. And um, I searched the rest of him, I'll give it a bag of sweets to the uh, lad who was next to him, fucking can't remember his name. And um, I turned around and said, oh, sit down. He sat down, as he sat down, he got a dig, he got a dig in the back of one of the, one of the lads, and they were all muttering fucking in, fucking Argentinian Spanish, wherever it was. And I thought, I grabbed the sweets and, they went, and I grabbed a couple and I passed them around to all our lads. I feel terrible about as well because they were fucking you know, sweets, you know. <laughs> I took all these sweets and gave them to all our lads and we're like, fuck, just bits. Somebody got Rolos and stuff and um, and toffee. And um, yeah, but, and, and then after, I often wonder what happened to him, whether when he went back on the camera or wherever he went back, whether he got, you know, whether he got filled in for fucking having a bag of sweets. He must have had a bag of sweets for weeks and months and just kept him hiding to himself and having them at night. Because they were starving, weren't they? He's probably got no teeth left now, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it's ru- yeah. they've all rotted out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's got. Ever since you nicked his sweets, he's just yeah. can't stop eating them. Yeah, yeah. So basically, um, the thirteenth, um, they must have took Mount um, Longdon and tumble down, and uh, and then the fourteenth, we were expecting to to take over from them, and then he just come through. Who told us we just, just started coming through? Um, they've surrendered, um, and then somebody was saying they'd just come off, somebody just come off a mat, uh, off one of the mountains and spotted the white flags. And then, funny enough, because obviously you, you see that famous saying now the white flags flying over Port Stanley, bloody marvelous. I, I remember that blog saying that, you know what I mean? He was from the Gurkhas, wasn't he? Yes, um, he was a sergeant major in the Gurkhas, I think, but yeah, I remember that. And then, obviously, it was just, it was just. Uh, pack your bags, uh, unload, get your stuff away. Nobody's fucking allowed to uh, fire any round, or you'd, like you said, you're in the shit. Um, but um, some most of the lads said, I'm not unloading, so we still loaded, but we didn't put it up to, up to shaft, you know, we didn't put the bow and we had it on safety. Um, and then we just we might we we yumped into Stanley, but um, because we were, I think, what the what the I hear what the the plan was for three power and the Gurkhas and the Scots Guards to take the hills in front of us, Mount Harriet. And then we were to come afterwards and then the Royal Marines were supposed to be the, the first ones to march into Stanley so that they could take back. And it was to be MP891 lads, you know, with 4-2 and all this. Don't know how true it is, but that's what I was told. That's what the plans were. Um, but apparently when... Um, Longdon was taken by the Paris and they started running down the track and legging it and apparently the Paris and I've heard this from some of the Paris as well instead of taking the Mount Longdon and then stopping they carried on 
going down the tracks and following them, firing them, killing them, uh, and even overtaking them. And they, they, they were actually in front of the RGs when they 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 actually overtaking them. And um, and there was orders to uh, a sergeant major or a sergeant to to stop and get themselves back to 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 London. Um, but they, they ignored it because I, I heard this one power actually say, I told my sergeant, it's on the radio, we've got to stop. And the sergeant said, no, fucking, we're going to be the first in. And that, that's that's how they got into into Stanley first. But we didn't. We basically yomped. And now I've been back. And now I realise what we did. Apparently we came over the top. I went through a golf course. I didn't even know there was a golf course on, on the fucking Falklands. We came around the golf course and came down Round, round the the back at the entrance of Stanley, and you could see. I think you could see Moody Brook in the distance, because when I asked them well, what's that over there, and they said that's Moody Brook. Um, and as we come in, we can, we came to the hangar. There was a there's a uh, there's a hangar, a, a plane hangar, which was used. For, I think it was used for mail and just for things. But that and uh, that that don't know where that had gone. I think the RGs were using it for things. But this this hangar was just covered. You've, you've seen the picture in thousands and thousands of rounds. And, the, mm. and you're not going to believe this. Now, a lot of people, you know, when they say they were on the, um, they were on the balcony. The SAS, I was on the balcony. There must have been fucking 12,000 people on that balcony. But that, um, that hangar, there was J Company in it, L Company, and K, I think, and us, um, headquarters. Now, we came in and as you walked into the, the door, you could see all them, all the, all the, where the rounds had been. It was that, that way. And, and I sat down next to a lad called Mossy. Um, I don't even know if he, he was in headquarters, but I, I got told to his name was Mossy. Cracking lad. And I'd seen him on and off over, you know, I was been going, yomping and stuff, getting, getting to there. And um, he sat down and I sat next to him. So he's here. He's facing that way, and he's doing something. He was, I think he was, um, he was GPMG is when he was doing somebody's rounds. And I was sat next to him, behind him, and I bent down, and I was doing something. And as I bent down and looked, somebody was taking a picture. And I remember thinking, oh, that would be a good picture, with, them, with them, that light coming in, because it was because mm-hmm. the light you could actually see on the ground. And then um, years and years later, that picture is quite iconic now. It's a good picture, isn't it? And I'm... They'd probably say fucking wasn't you. You'd say you were on the balcony, but I'm fucking hundred percent sure. Well, that's well, it's a thousand percent Mossy. Everybody says that's Mossy. I'm a thousand percent sure that the one behind him with the silhouette, but you can't see with this, is me. But um, it's nice to think that we got we got some shelter. We actually got some shelter instead of the trenches um, in Stanley, and it was one of the best places. That, that we had really, except for the um, the sheep shed as well, which I think was in Teal Inlet. We we, we got to, but we had to uh, we had to sleep in this sheep shed in Teal Inlet, and that's where that pilot came, I think. Um, yeah, so we were obviously in that hangar, and then it was just wait for orders, um, and I think the next day um, we were just wandering around, sort of getting orders to, to go and grab a couple of RGs and tell them to pick up this body that had been found. Because as we were, as we were yomping in, we, we could see RG bodies on corrugated sheeting that had just been put placed on top of them just to sort of try and hide, the, hide, the, hide them. And you could see their arms sticking out and their legs and stuff um, in funny shapes. So you think, fuck, how's your fucking, how's your body got that shape? And then, um, so one day, I think it was, probably for, for maybe the 15th or the 16th, a couple of days after. Um, we were in the anger, and I fancied to wander around. I wanted to go and look around because um, we were just chilling in the anger. We weren't doing anything that time. So I went out, and I went out with, I think he was a corporal or a sergeant, and I went out with him, and he was experienced. Fuck, see, my name, my uh, names I'm shit at. If I, if I remember his, his face, I remember, because I'm shit at names now, too many left hooks. And I went out with him and he said, come on, we're going to have a wander around. And I think he took me out to show me around, to, to train my body to what I was about to see. Even, you know, because I hadn't seen 
I'd only seen that one on the scimitar. I didn't see what some of the lads at KNL and Goose Green and things they'd seen and bayonets and things because obviously we only sort of kept cover for um, on Mount Elliot. So I think I don't know because he thought I was young. He, I don't know if he thought I'm going to take him out and I need to t- toughen this little shit up. And then we kept on walking. We went and looked around the three trenches. There's um, a couple of bodies by the trench and they've been covered up. Uh, and then I spotted this plastic bag and um, I'd bought some binoculars off the camera. don't know why. It's just a stupid thing you do. I bought some binoculars. And I always had them with me. They were in my burger. And, uh, and I spotted this plastic bag and it had binoculars in. And I thought, oh, I picked it up. And I thought, I need binoculars. I fucking, I've got a pair of them. So I threw it away. Lo and behold, I find out months later that there was night vision goggles that the RGs had and they were fucking brilliant. And everybody wanted them and throwing them away. Gutted. So we walk up the walk up the, the hill a bit more and then I spot this torso, this Argentinian, with um, his arms all over the place. And he he's um he's looking up and he and he's he's either wide open. And it's strange there's this torso, two arms ahead, and he's out and he's walking, he's look and it's raining. This is what was getting in my head. I can't understand. It's raining, right? And it's raining quite hard because all of a sudden it's gone from sunny. It's fucking raining in the Falklands because that's what he did. And as I'm walking up the hill and I spot him and I see the the face, the the shape of him and everything, I'm thinking, that's a fucking strange shape. His eyes are wide open. So for some stupid reason, I tried to close them like they do in the movies and they wouldn't close. I thought, I can't these fucking eyes. And um, they wouldn't close. And then I remember looking up and thinking, fucking hell, I can't keep my eyes because the, the rain was that hard I couldn't keep my eyes open but I remember looking at him and thinking why are you not closing your eyes because fucking how, how are you doing that so I looked up again and I thought I'm going to see if I can keep my eyes open I don't know why and so I looked up and I went ah and within milliseconds I, I just couldn't the rain was too hard and I kept closing I was thinking so I got, I got my I got my fingers and I went ah and I still couldn't keep them open I kept closing so I rubbed my eyes and I thought that fucking makes sense. I, met, I knelt down to him and I tried to close his eyes and they just wouldn't close. Pissed me off because I, I wanted to try and help him because it was raining. I could see, I could see the um, the raindrops banging into his eyelids. Weird uh, eyeballs. Somebody shouted, "There's one here. Can you put can you put uh, some cover over him?" So they put a cover over him and that was, that was basically it. So I went back into the um, back into the anger, and then um, over the next few days, we just got orders to to go in, going to Stanley, but I never, ever got in more than 30 yards into Stanley from the edge, um, the Moody Brook edge. And I never, ever got into Stanley, so I never seen Stanley in my life. Never seen the lads saying they went into the pub, the Globe pub or something, Globe Hotel, the other pubs, and um, obviously Governor House and things like that. I never could see any of that. I never, ever seen any of that. The only time I think I remember going through is when we went back onto the camera but I remember talking to an Argentinian sergeant who could speak fantastic English and I was sat down talking to him and I was like you know are you happy about being here and he was like well how old are you and I was seven fucking hell he said Jesus because he speak brilliant, brilliant English uh, and then I said how come you speak really good English he said well I used to live in England I went to university Cambridge and uh, my wife's English and I've got two children maybe one sec so he'd lived in England? Yeah, he'd lived in England. He'd gone to Cambridge University. He spoke brilliant English. He asked me what team I supported. And uh, if, I'm, if I'm right, Argentina had just been knocked out. The World Cup and we were all laughing. All the boards were taking the piss and the powers were laughing their heads off because Argentina had just lost in the World Cup because the World Cup was on at the time, wasn't it? Uh, and I think they just got beat and they were knocked out and we were all in stitches laughing. And um, But yeah, yeah, he had two kids. He went to Cambridge University and then he had an English wife and they lived in they lived in um, Argentina. But I said to him, where's your, where's your wife and children? He said, in Argentina. And I've, I thought, Jesus, man, I bet she's, she's having a good time there. Fucking English person with two children, you know what I mean? Probably speaks good Argentinian because he looked like he'd been married quite a few years. I think his kids were somewhere like seven and nine. And um, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, because mm. we so basically, um, 
lots of things obviously went on. Different dads have got different stories of what went on in Stanley, but I just remember being so stinking and and what a mess they made, and you know, no respect, for, you know, and, and just shitting all over the place. And so basically, for the next couple of days, or well, until we left and went back on the camera, um, we got them to clean it all up and send them all down to the airport. Which I didn't. Obviously, I only went about 50, 60 yards. But I did. I, did, I was there. Um, I think a load of us. Loads of us and loads of us gathered round and lay down uh, because a 500 pound bomb had been found near Moody, Moody Brook. It hadn't gone off. And so the bomb disposal team were actually over there. And it come round, word come round that um, if you all come out of the anger, a load of us come out and sat on the grass and watched this, um, this bomb being, you know, controlled, exploded. And um, I remember going off. And you could see it coming off, and then within three seconds, the uh, the boom, the boom, the, the other sound came. About two or three seconds afterwards, and it's a fucking big boom. I was thinking, shit, a five hundred pound bomb, man. And that they had five hundred pound bombs go inside the uh, the Royal Navy ships, didn't we? And I was thinking, fucking poor lads, man. Yeah, one of them went off, didn't it, when they were trying to disarm it? Yeah, I think I'm not too sure. Yeah, I don't don't know what ship that was. It might, yeah, it wasn't the Ardent. Because I think the Ardent, that was the one that uh, broke into a V and then burnt in the night. Because that's obviously I've seen that. Um, I'm, I've, I'm not sure whether I've seen it on camera, obviously from the night when they come onto the ship, or whether it was the next. Well, the, definitely the next day, I've seen it in the light, and it was just, just like a V. In the that's when, well, when Sheffield got blown up that's when it when that's when it struck but yeah it was terrible to see HMS Arden like that. Yeah I think Arden I'm just looking now I think Arden rolled over and sank I might be yeah I might be wrong was it the, there was Coventry the Coventry Arden. Coventry um Sheffield was it and yeah. the antelope yeah the antelope was it the antelope there was a uh, like a V yeah, I'm just having a look. It was Sir, yeah. was Sir Galahad, wasn't there? And uh, yeah, they're, they're well, they were well into the not well in, but they were quite a few days into the uh, into the um, into the war. And I call it a war. Do you know why I call it a war? And people call it a conflict. Some which winds you up. Yeah, well, everyone calls it a war now, don't they? There was some yeah, weird. Do you know why I call it a war? Go on, mate. Uh, because back in M Company. When I was told I wasn't going to the um, to the Falklands, um, when I came out, all the lads were talking about how old are you? And I said, 17, 17 and a half. And they went, you can't come. And I went, what do you mean I can't come? They said, you're only 17. You've got to be 18 to go to war. So I actually went back into the Sergeant Major's office and knocked on the door. And he said, what do you want? I come in. I said, um, am I actually going? And he went, what do you mean are you going? And he gave me a bollocking because he thought I was sort of bottling it. He thought I, I didn't want to go. And obviously with my mum ringing up, um, he thought, fucking I've got somebody bottling it here. And he, um, he said, of course you're going. I said, well, can I just ask a question? He went, yeah. He said, of course you can. I said, well, how come I can't go to Northern Ireland until I'm 18, but I'm going to Falklands? And he went, son, the Falklands is a war. Northern Ireland is a conflict. You can't go to the Northern Ireland because it's a fun conflict but you're going to war and you can go to war at 17 months, uh, 17 years and six months. And you are, you are that. So you're, you're going now get out of my office. And I fucking did. And that's how I, I always call it a war now because he told me when I, the way I was, if I'm told to do something, I do it. If I ask somebody to do something and they don't do it, they get one chance. It fucking winds me up. And it may be just the way we've been taught. You know what I mean? Revive yeah, five minutes. Okay. Do what you're told. Five minutes, five minutes early. And, uh, yeah, he said it was a war, so to me, it's always been a war. What uh, what happened then, David, between you being in Port Stanley and, and did you go back on the Canberra? Yeah, I went, I went back on the Canberra, but this time, obviously the MOD or somebody had a, obviously had a, a good thing, rethink, and um, four or five came back with us. So we had four or five, four, two and 40, all on the Canberra. And we had the, I think uh, the powers went back on Queen Elizabeth and some back on the Norland 
but we had we had the better the better uh, trip back because we just partied non-stop and, and, and funny the funny thing is like I said to you it took ages to get down there it only took nine days to get back so we then knew that all this stories about oh we're just turning round because um, we might be uh, heading back home they weren't true that they were doing zigzags and turning around because they were just wasting time trying to they hold. were stalling yeah were the Americans were yeah Haig was it Poindexter as well I, I... Yeah, yeah I know I remember the name Haig Go yeah on. Haig yeah. Um, they they were trying to negotiate something, but it didn't it didn't come off. So I went back on the camera and um, had a right laugh because on the way down <clears throat> there's a bloke called Moz Tombs. People know Moz Tombs. I met I uh, <clears throat> I didn't realise who Moz was. Uh, I met him at uh, Sergeant Blackman. Um, thing we did. Uh, he used to bring loads of coaches down. He was brilliant, and he owns a pub called the Foundy Arms in the pool. Mm. Uh, brilliant lad. And I didn't realise that Moz Toombs was the lad that was on the mic on the way down to the Falklands that sang, we're all going on a pussy's holiday, we're all going to kill a speck or two. And uh, it was him. And um, it wasn't until I think, it is, that's like Moz Toombs. And, um, yeah, but we had a party, good party on the way down. Then it got serious. Um, and I came back as a man, not a boy. Mm. And then, um, then we had a party on the way home and then the best homecoming you've ever seen in your life you know women with boobs hanging out of me me 17 what I'm gonna you know what I mean what yeah. um it, were many of the lads badly affected on the way back or is it too oh, early for it do, to have do, sunk in yeah do you know what the funny thing is there was a lad called Paul Tinker who I passed out with and he was he was either in the uh, he was in the next bunk to me and we used because we passed out together we used to walk around the camera, go for meals together and everything. And um, I never heard of anything. I think we just come back, we just seemed to party. But last night I was talking to Paul Tinker because he's one of the lads, 22, that we're going to be meeting um, after 40 years, which is great. And um, we, I was asking, because I'm trying to put my jigsaw, but I'm trying to get it in my head, everything's right, you know, so it doesn't feel like I'm telling lies or things. And... Um, he actually said, yeah, he said, the lad in my bunk, bunk, he said he was the one that was having really bad problems and, um, um, you know, obviously couldn't take it and ended up going to, uh, to, the, to the medics and got to go and see a psychiatrist. I'm like, hey, I never heard any of that. Much. But, but I never heard of anything, but obviously there was, there must have been things going on um, on the way back. And uh, I can't blame them because me, sometimes I feel like, it doesn't feel like I was there because I didn't see. Obviously, I seen I seen Jan being injured and me dragging him down. I seen that poor soldier on the on the scimitar. Um, I seen the, the poor lad um, by the hangar up on the hill, um, and then the bodies around, obviously covered by corrugated sheeting and stuff like that. But I haven't. I never really seen anything what I call as bad. If you know, know what I mean. I don't. Know if you, so sometimes I. And all because I was young, sometimes I don't feel like I was there. But me and my wife went back as guest of honour because the, the Falklands government invited me back on the 35th anniversary, um, which was really nice of them. I got chauffeur driven. I got really looked after. And the Falklands Islands people just love you to death because you're a veteran. And that when I went back and um, we went to Mount Harriet and me and my wife um, walked up Mount Harriet and... Um, it had been the first time that I'd sort of been to the top of Mount Aya because I never got to the top because I was obviously giving fire and uh, cover fire for the lads going up there. And um, so it was nice for me to go up the top and see things. There's a lot of things still up there that people shouldn't be touching. They should leave them there, you know what I mean, like comms and stuff like that. But my wife, I was saying to my wife, like, this is where they did this. This is where they did this, this. And she went, babe, I said, what? She went, it was you as well. And... Sometimes it doesn't. It does. I don't know if it's a good thing because it's it's stuck in behind in the back of that brain and it's in a file cabinet and it's staying there. Do you know what I mean? So maybe it's my way of dealing with it. I say they went. So yeah, it's, it's strange. But my wife was she was really annoyed. She was like, "Babes, you were there as well." I'm like, "Oh yeah, of course I was." Yeah, strange. Yes. Yes. You well. You 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 definitely <laughs> you're definitely there, Davy. <laughs> Um, and tell us uh, what 
what was the f- feeling then when you pulled pulled into Southampton? Well, obviously, um, I don't know if you know, um, um, we pulled in a day or yeah, quite a few hours early um, outside of Southampton. So we had to dock outside. And then when we're like, why have we stopped? We weren't expecting these thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. But we thought we'd just get dock and get into the truck, put the kid back and get back to Bickley Bouts and wherever we were going. And um, we pulled up and we looked outside and then and drop anchor and then we get told by the captain that obviously tomorrow morning I think it was 11 o'clock uh, you're going to um, dock at um, I forgot the name of the dock now you're going to dock um, in Southampton and there's so many people come to see you. it's going to be fantastic we're like oh brilliant All right. so we just spent the night drinking beers contemplating looking over the over the barrier obviously and, and just looking into the distance of the, 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 the um, Southampton lights and waiting for the, the day to come the next day. And then obviously the next day was just flotilla of boats after boats after boat and women getting their boobies out and <laughs> flags flying. And, oh, it was amazing. Um, and what you, did, did your parents come down there? Yeah, my dad come down, my mum come down, um, my little brother, me sister and my brother came down. Well, I think they all came down to be fair in the car. And apparently it took them absolutely hours and hours and hours to get down. So bless them. But when they got there, they got there um, sort of late. They, they, we were coming in. They got to see the top of the ship, if you know what I mean, but they didn't, at the camera, but they didn't get to be at the front where everybody, uh, and it took me, well, mobile phones them day, it took me ages uh, to tell them. I think what they were doing over the town, I was saying, right, this is, company coming down this is so and so troop and so you could grab them and get out of the way um, but the funny thing was the night before we, we had a lot of um, souvenirs didn't we a lot of lads had souvenirs I mean some of the lads had some of the lads had the GPMG Argentinian GPMGs and um, and F- FNs the, the SLRs some of, I had a grenade but but I disarmed it I might say I, I, had, I had a round like a, a green um, grenade, which I disarmed. One of the lads, um, we disarmed them together. We, but we all had one each. Crazy. Um, I had a nine millimeter pistol still in the packet, brand spanking new, never come out, and a, and a couple of other things. And um, we, we, we threw them over the side. We actually threw them over the side mm. um, because we got told that the um, that the customs were coming. On the day that we we came out, the customs was coming, and uh, they were going to search us all. So, and that, that night before, in between drinking beers, the amount of stuff that is outside and down in the in, in Southampton is unbelievable. There's everything down there, everything. I even heard one lad saying he he got a bazooka, like some sort of bazooka. I was like, what? The things we we threw over the side, unbelievable. But obviously, the next day was one of the best days of my life. Listening to um, the Royal Marine Band playing and watching the thousands of flags and things. And, yeah, amazing, amazing. But I didn't actually go home. I went back to Bickley Barracks and because I was headquarters, um, I think I went home five days later. We didn't go home for five days. Most, some of us didn't go back. We went back to Bickley Barracks. We had to clean it all the stuff, put it away and every, square everything away because, you know, Royal Marines are on. Um, alert 24 Remember, hours. did you go shoring, Gus, in those five days? No, no, I just all we did is clean, clean, clean. Um, stayed in Bickley Barracks, didn't do anything. And then, lo and behold, if you remember right, there, there was a um, there was a train strike. I hadn't passed my test, so I didn't have a car. There was a train strike, so I couldn't get home. Can you believe it? So I hitchhiked and I actually hitchhiked home from, from the Falklands. Um, tell you what. Yeah, anyone would have picked you up then, right? You're not going to believe this, but I had um, Union Jack shorts on, Royal Marines um, t-shirt with Royal Marines on the back, um, a little tiny Bergen, and a backpack, um, and my green berry. I put the green berry on. I put it on purpose to hopefully get a lift. And probably, I think, from about half an hour from Plymouth to Stoke where my mum lived 
I got a lift from there to Stoke by a, by a lorry driver. And he just pulled over straight away and he went, you Greenberry, mate? I went, yeah. He said, fucking them Royal Marines did well. I said, that was me. I was one of the youngest. Get in my fucking cab, he said. And he took me. I don't know where the hell he was going. He didn't care. He took me all the way from about half an hour from Plymouth all the way to Stoke. And the funny thing was, I told my mum I was coming home and she had a street party for me. And there was banners all along the street with Royal Marines and welcome home and well done, Davey, and all this. And he dropped me. My mum lived in the Coronation Street, like Coronation Drive Road. So you've got a road where there's loads of colleges. It's called uh, Shelton. It's called Shelton, where the colleges are. And then you've got the road, which people might know if they live in Stoke. You've got the road. And then you've got Coronation Street houses, rows of houses. Then the other end of the road was the garage. He dropped me in the garage. right? So I'm, obviously, go along the road, find out the name of my street, Bedford Street, it was called, and turning and Bedford. Now, as I'm walking up, they're all facing the other way. Everybody's facing the other way. And they're all getting ready to clap and sing and cheer and everything. And I walked up to my mum, and she was facing the other way, and I tapped her on the back, and I went, Royal Marines, sneaky beaky around the back, mum. And she went, mm-hmm. fucking hell, he's here. And they turned around, and they all give me a cheer and give me a hug. But I came the wrong way. I'd sneak, sneaked in around the back. <laughs> but, yeah, that, that was my sort of homecoming. Davey, it's an incredible story. Um, I don't want to finish, though, without just touching on your your firefighter career. Um, just, you know, can you just tell us in brief, did, did the carnage you saw in the Falklands help, pre- pre- it help you for the, the carnage you saw in the fire brigade? Yeah, well, obviously, I, I left the Royal Marines in 88, very beginning of 88, the term professional. I decided I was doing really well. I, I'd been um, uh, chosen for the Commonwealth Games, uh, chosen for the, um, the the Olympic squad, but not the GP squad that actually went. I didn't get picked for that. But I, I trained with the GP, the, the, trained with the Olympic squad, Los Angeles Olympics. And so I was, I was doing really well. So I decided to leave the Royal Marines. Wish I hadn't. But um, I, I left the Royal Marines to turn professional boxing. And uh, I did quite well. I did really well, to be fair. And But I kept getting cuts like Henry Cooper. So... I went and boxed down in, um, um, I went boxed down south on uh, in a pier and Terry Marsh was there. Remember Terry Marsh? Um, former Royal Marine, world champion um, firefighter who unfortunately got uh, kicked out of the fire service because they thought he had epilepsy, mm. uh, but he didn't. He was basically, he was um, dehydrating too much and he fainted um, because of his fights I and mean, he became world champion. He was at the show and he said to me, join the fire service. Why don't you join the fire service? So I joined the fire service uh, because he told me it was two days, two nights, four off. So in the days I could train the night, in the night I could train in the day. And on my four days off, I had four days. Off, so I could train every day to be a professional boxer. So I joined the fire service. And when I joined the fire service, straight away, we have a really bad, really bad accident um, involving two girls in the car. And... Um, um, it was my job to 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 hold the, the head. The, the roof had been taken off. My job to hold the head um, whilst they cut the seat belt and remove these two girls and put them into body bags. And um, th- they were a right mess. And straight away, one of the lads come up to me and said, "You're all right, mate. You okay?" And I said, "Mate, yeah, I'm fine. Don't worry about it." He said, "Yeah, but you know, I mean, this is your first job." And I went, "No offense, mate, but I was in the Royal Marines. I went down the Falklands. I said to me." This, this is all right. And he went, all right, cheers, mate. And as he walked away, I said, I bet she's got a fucking headache. Started laughing and he'd burst out laughing. And that's the way you have to deal with it. You know what I mean? And when we went back to the station at the end of every... Uh, days, they say, right, lads, we're having a debrief. Right, outside the fire engine now, after the job's been finished, they'll get you behind the fire engine. They'll say, right, a big debrief. This is what happened, blah, blah. Can we do anything better? 20 minute spiel. And then they'll go back to the fire station. They'll have a chat around the table. But well, we used to just go back to the station. If we'd done to the chat, we'd chat, but we just make jokes about it. Things you maybe shouldn't have done on some of the things, but you had to. It was your way of dealing with it. And that's the way the fire service dealt with it then. They probably deal with it a lot different now. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the, the fire service helped me to deal with uh, what's in. Um, uh, to be fair, fire service to me was like, just a job to me it was nothing to what 
even though I've seen some terrible things in the fire service, um, they were both the same, really, I suppose. But they did help me, yeah, 100%. They helped mm. me well. What's the, what was the worst thing you saw, Davey? Um, I'd have to say um, we've got... Basically, I've seen um, uh, a girl who was pregnant, her mum and her sister... All in a house fire, which was, which was um, set fire to deliberately by um, her ex boyfriend, who needed to get rid of them uh, due to um, she was fifteen at the time. So they, they told you she would, she'd already had one child, and she was um, and she was fifteen with another one. Uh, so that tells you the reason why he needed to get rid of her. Mm. I won't say no more about that. But that, that was the worst one. Going there. Um, and basically seeing that, I'm not going to go into it because obviously a lot of people, um, the way where I live, um, they remember that fire. It's still it's still in in the in the the news today over some other reasons. Um, yeah, because if he's trying to get out, he's trying to get himself out of prison. Still, he's in prison for a hell of a long time. Mm. But uh, yeah, and I, I didn't want to bring any bad memories up for them people. But yeah, um, one of them actually. Um, was the uncle of one of the girls, and I didn't even realise he was he was my friend was one of the uncles, which is a shame. But yeah, I've, I've seen kind of a lot of bad things in the fire service. I did 20, 27 years in the fire service, and the reason I did that was because I had five years, thirty five days given back to me by the fire service. So the fire service, just by the Royal Marines, sorry, the fire service is part of the Royal Marines discipline and same pension scheme. So I was allowed to only do the equivalent to 30 years and then I could leave the fire service after 30 years. So I actually only have to do 25 years or to a certain age. And so I did 27. But yeah, yeah, it did help me. The, it did help me. The Royal Marines helped me. Big, yeah. yeah. I I just wanted to get, get an example from you, Davey, because it's all too easy for, for those of us that sit at home and don't do a job like that. To, yeah. you know, I was at the school fair the other day and the, the fire brigade turn up like they do and the kids climb around the engine and, and you, 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 you forget the absolute seriousness of that job. Yeah. We had a, where I, where I, one of the places I grew up as a kid, there was a, a car full of youngsters. Like literally they were all in their teens and it come around the corner too fast, went off the road, smashed for a fence and, and, burst into flames. Yeah. And I remember my dad saying, it was all this screaming last night and I was woken up and I was effing and blinding because I thought it was, you know, yobs mucking around. Yeah. Turned out that this had happened. My mate's dad was, uh, it was a village, so they're all like standby firefighters, right? Yeah, retained, yeah. Retained, yeah. And uh, my mate's dad had to go and deal with it. And uh, they they were all trapped in the car. They couldn't get out, so none of, none of, none of them lived. Yeah, and it's just insane to think your mate's dad, and and literally my yeah. mate lived about yeah. four hundred meters from where it was. So yeah. my mate's dad had to go and bloody bloody deal with it. And it's um, yeah, yeah. I was, I was told by the lads when I when I left the Romney and joined the fire service. Um, we we'd have um because you're allowed to sleep um, rest period between twelve midnight and seven in the morning because uh, we did fifteen hour nights um, but you never slept because you always you're always ready to be going down the pole within and in the fire engine within fifteen um, forty five seconds at night fifteen seconds in the day and um, they, we used to come down have a bite to eat breakfast in the morning they used to say to me fucking hell mate you did some shouting you sleep last night I'm like what and they go what the fuck's right flanking incoming take cover. Oh, all right, okay. And I fucking start laughing. And apparently, I was I used to shout, right flanking, incoming, take cover, and fucking all the time. And then it, it, uh, one day, come down, they went, oh, you, you, you didn't you didn't shout last night, or you didn't know, and gradually, it stopped. Mm. Uh, yeah, but that, that was my sort of... Um, if I went to another fire station, sometimes they'd be short, and they'd say, right, Davey, you got to go over to Shrewsbury, or you've got to go to Wellington Fire Station, go and cover for the night. They'd say, fucking hey, do you ever shut up, Scouts? Help me in your sleep as well. Davey, brother, this has been an incredible, incredible chat. Thanks so much for sharing your story. 
Um, and I don't know what, uh, I don't think you're supposed to say congratulations on your 40th anniversary, but you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I, I, I hope it's um, treating everybody all right. I hope it's, I know there's been some, quite a few reunions. There was one here last weekend and I was fortunate enough to, to meet a couple of the guys before they went off to yeah. meet their um, conflict buddies. And um, yeah, I just hope everyone's doing all right. And that, uh, like I said earlier, one day a year to remember your mates is, is good, but you got to leave the rest of it. That's you got to leave the rest of it behind. You have. And I, I, can I just say, if any of the lads end up watching this, uh, 4-2 Commando, Bickley Barracks, serving lads. What an absolute pleasure. And awesome machine. They, 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 they are. I wish, and you probably do, we wish we were in the Royal Marines now because they do a fantastic job. They volunteered for the weekend to invite us old vets down. They looked after us. They showed us the, the new machinery that they've got, which they turn on every single one. Um, and seven out of ten of them apparently are, have got degrees now. So they're not only ocean machines. Um, with amazing f- uh, physiques, but they're intelligent as well. And, and they, and they, um, the commanding officer of Four Two Commando gave us a fifteen-minute speech. There was four, three hundred and eighty of us that arrived back, um, and we were well looked after. And he gave us a little fifteen-minute speech about what the Royal Marines do. And I'm obviously not going to say, but they're all over the world. Four Two Commando are not just in, in Berkeley Barracks; they are all, all over the world, and obviously, and and they're busy. And the things they're getting up to, and you think, wow, I wish I was back in. Mm. So I just want to congratulate um, um, 14 Commando Serving Lads for looking after us. It's an absolute pleasure uh, talking to you all. And the Commanding Officer of um, 14 Commando, thank you for, for all you did for us. And Colonel Vaux, who I actually met, uh, he was there. Um, I walked up to him because uh, he did a little speech before we went on the drill yard to do the um, march past. Um, I walked up to him and as I walked up to him he's, he's, he's <laughs> I don't know he just remembered me and then I went hello sir can I shake your hand and thank you for looking after me I was I was only and I was about to say I was only set, and he went yes you were only 17 year old and your mother you, she is very assertive <laughs> and um, I was like wow and even you remembered you remembered me mm. which is amazing and I've been told that he remembers all Every one of his lads. In- I don't think he has to travel that far because, if I remember rightly, my my dad used to sell him his sell and fit his carpets. Yeah, and uh, my dad lives out that way. Yeah, um, he, honestly, he's brilliant. And um, it, it, the most amazing thing to end with is the forty year reunion. We all lined up on on the drill yard. Uh, sorry, on the they've got an astroturf thing. You know, like an astroturf. Um, sort of uh, pitch and we were on there and um, Julian Thompson came and Colonel Vaux both of them stood on the on the pedestal whatever you want to call it up on, the, up on there and there on the stand uh, and Royal Marines 4-2 Commander Royal Marines attention um, by turn to your duties and then gave the exactly same order that he gave 40 years ago to the South Atlantic, to your duties, quick march. And it took me back. And I think some of the other lads said they just for a split second felt like they were in that spot at the same time again. So we mm-hmm. marched around, given the, the um, eyes, Ed Red, Ed right, eyes right. And then, um, and then marked around the, marched around the, around the camp, stopped outside the memorial area, mm-hmm. uh, went in, did a lovely memorial, and then went and did what we all did good. Good at, and got drunk afterwards and hugged each other and 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 listened to the um, the sergeant's mess beating of the drum by the Royal Marines band who, that they did that for us and that was fantastic as well. So it all ended up fantastic and um, well worth going because it was the first one I've been to in forty years. It was my first one. We well, deserve it, mate. You know, it's uh, it's it, it's um, always good to catch up with old oppos. Yeah. We have a reunion every every year, and uh, it's. Well, like, um, like I said, mine mine's just this be the first one, forty years that we all meet up two seven six troop meet up. I can't wait to meet all the lads, 
Um, and we're going to meet up in Exmouth. We're meeting in Exmouth to, um, for the weekend. So I'm looking forward to it in September. Good, good. Is it get down the puffing billy, isn't it? I think that's still there. Know, it's, all, it's all changed now, isn't it? But I'll, yeah. we'll find a pub somewhere and no doubt we will. Davey, come back and chat to us again at some some point, hopefully. Yeah, okay, um, my friend. Thanks, cheers, Royal. Much appreciated. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. I hope to see you soon. Yeah, take care. And to everybody at home, massive, massive thank you for tuning in to another uh, edition of the Bought the T-Shirt podcast. If you can like and subscribe, uh, that will be much appreciated. Um, I hope you enjoyed this chat uh, as much as I did and uh, look after yourselves. We'll see you next time.